Hello, this is Coach Aaron Saft, the Running is Life podcast. Today is a long episode, so I'm going to talk to Ben Gons first and then Mike Reardon about their experiences at the Coca Dona 250. Both um, had amazing experiences and we have a lot to share. So strap in because it's going to be a long run here. <laughs> Enjoy it and I'll talk to you at the end. First guest on this podcast is Ben Gons. And actually, Dr. Ben Gon, excuse me. <laughs> uh, doctor, how are you this evening? Well, I guess it's this I'm evening. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good this evening. Um, been catching up on a lot of sleep and a lot of uh, overindulgence in eating. Um, <laughs> it's been it's been it's been good. It's been an interesting experience for sure. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to talk about the recovery process as well. But let's uh, let's go way back and just kind of talk about Ben. Where did Ben come from, and how did he involve? into the, sure. the Coca Dunna 250 monster he is today. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I did my first marathon when I was in residency, actually, um, okay. back in 2014. And I thought that was it. You know, there's nothing beyond a marathon. 26.2 miles. It's the biggest, you know, the biggest route anybody can do. <laughs> um, and okay. then... When, I, where was that one? Just to give us that reference. Was, it was the Indianapolis uh, Monumental Marathon. Okay. I did it with my brother. And that's when I was living in Indianapolis. I live in uh, Bryson City, North Carolina now. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in Indianapolis. Okay. Um, yeah. And then moved around from medical school to Arizona, actually. So I had a taste of what the weather was going to be like um, while I was out in med school. Okay. And then found myself um, kayaking a lot in the uh, the white waters of the Nanahale Outdoor Center out in out here in Western North Carolina and just found myself drawn to the mountains. So after residency, I moved out to Western North Carolina in Bryson city. So that's where I, I live and work now. And that's my home. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, what, um, what made you, uh, or what led you to the marathon? Were you running prior to med school? I didn't run until I was in grad school. Um, I did my first 5k and then it just kind of, you know how it is. It consumes you from there. <laughs> Um, I did you know, a 10 miler and then a half marathon. And I thought I was a beast and then the marathon. Um, and then I met a woman who I was trying to impress. And I said, <laughs> I, I run marathons. And she said, that's cute. And I said, you know, <laughs> what do you mean? And, um, she said, you know, have you heard of ultra marathons? And I'm like, no. Um, so she, to impress her, I did my first, um, 50k which was actually your race uh the solly frosty foot okay yeah so that was my very first one was i think that was 2020 was your last year as race director yeah yep uh, right before the pandemic hit right. um yep. so i did my first 50k and fell in love with that style of running not necessarily you know running for time or anything it was just kind of can we complete it before the end goal can we complete it before the cutoff time yeah um in love with that and then the pandemic hit so i did a lot of map marking um here in the smokies um because everything kind of got canceled i put together my own uh 50 mile race out in the abrams area of the smoky mountains and did cool. that with the help of um that woman i did in fact impress um so she helped kind of crew me for this self-made 50 miler <laughs> um i i didn't dnf but they let you drop back i did a race called tunnel hill mm -hmm. um in and I was going to crew myself. Um, and if you don't think you can put, complete the hundred, they'll let you drop back and complete the 50 and take a, sure, you know, not take the DNF. So on that race, I met a couple who was like, uh, yeah, we use Aaron Saft as our coach. <laughs> and so that was the, that was the, oh, wait, you know, we're, I'm, I, we're in Illinois and I'm talking to people who live in Western <laughs> North Carolina. So that was cool in and of itself. Yeah. Right. And then I said, oh, I know Aaron. He was the race director for my first ultra. <laughs> um, and then we got connected, I want to say, three years ago. Yes. Yeah. Um, you helped me complete my my next 100-mile race, which was the Pistol in Alcoa, Tennessee. Yeah. Um, after that, I, I, I dabble in other sports, mountaineering. I went and climbed Aconcagua. Um, so I took a little bit of a break from running. And when I came back, um, I remember watching the live stream of Cocodona and just thinking how cool that was. And it just <laughs> looked like it looked like it was a lot of fun and a lot of hurt. 
<laughs> um, and those things I, I'm very drawn to. And so I think I actually dropped in on the live stream the last day and and hit my submit button on ultra sign up and was like, <laughs> I'm doing it. And then I remember, I think I texted you and I wasn't sure what the response was going to be. <laughs> you know, I was like, Hey, I signed up for Coca Dona. And is he going to say back, why'd you do that? <laughs> like, you know, maybe you should have consulted with me first. <laughs> Um, but you were more than positive and encouraging. Um, and so I think training started last summer, basically. Right, right. And that, that was after, because um, we had the um, Georgia Jewel. that you know, I did the Georgia, I, I, I signed up for the Georgia Jewel. I DNF'd that. Um, it just wasn't, it was a placeholder. It was something to look forward to, but I didn't really have a lot of umph in there. I got to mile 40, met up with my crew, and I was like, do you guys want to grab a beer? I'm just not really into this right now. <laughs> um, obviously, that wasn't going to happen at Coca Dona. Right. But, right. Um, yeah, so we've been training ever since. Um, and it, it really picked up, gosh, I guess that would have been March, was when our peak training load was happening. Yeah. And that was 60 to 70 mile weeks, um, plus the sauna training for the heat acclimatization. Um, yeah, which we can talk about. Yeah, oh, yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, but well, talk about just you know to go back, kind of talk about the difference of what you felt between um, Georgia Jewel and kind of your your motivation or lack thereof, <laughs> and what was the difference between uh, your motivation and and draw to to Coca Dona that just kind of lit that fire so much deeper and brighter, I guess. I, I think because it was a distance that at the beginning, I didn't think I could achieve. I'd done a hundred miler before. Sure. Um, it, it, it just didn't have anything in it for me at the end besides a belt buckle and, you know, a pat on the back. Um, Coca Dona was people don't think I can do this. I don't, sh I'm not sure if I can do this. Also my, my dad had passed away um, mm -hmm. when I was out doing a Concagua and that was kind of a, a big deal for me to do it for him and just for his memory. Um, and the, I think the other thing is having a crew and pacers that were out there with me. You know, they, they, I had four people who gave up a week of their lives to just support me and tape my feet and feed me and tell me to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I could not quit for them. I had to keep going. Um, so it helped to have other people that I was doing it for, not just myself. Mm -hmm. And it was... It was an experience I really wanted to have. I stopped looking at it like a race and looked at, at it kind of just like an elongated sort of ayahuasca experience. Um, I was going to have some highs and lows and some hallucinations. <laughs> and it was just about, you know, getting up and continuing to go. Yeah. And it was it was a lot deeper of a burn for me. And <laughs> and, it, and it showed up. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. it's so important. I mean, I, it's I, you know, I use that because I want to just stress to listeners that if your why isn't impassioned, if it's not deep enough, if it's not intrinsic enough, that it just gets so much harder when it gets darker for you to want to continue, you know, and, and right. having that intrinsic value and understanding the fact that it goes beyond you and it can affect others. You know, like you said, there's four others now that have sacrificed a week of their time to come be with you you know, and, and realizing the sacrifice others make and not just while you're out there racing, you know, the sacrifices that others have make for you to get to that starting line. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, 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 that's a great, you know, that's a great piece to share. I wanted to make sure that we, we got that out there. So 100%. And, and I felt that I, I yeah. felt, you know, after I want to say when January 1st hit and I knew there was the year of Coca Dona, even though mm -hmm. it was still five months away, I was like, oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> and just having that intrinsic inner uh, anxiety made me feel like I knew that I was ready to at least attempt it. Yeah. Did you, you know? Any... I... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was no, just no, gonna, did you have anything around the house that as a reminder that, you know, like. Uh... I watch Coca Dona videos <laughs> every night. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. I watched West Plate complete his three or whatever he did. And there were some long form documentaries on Coco Dona, right? I mean, there's yeah. six hours long. And I would just cry at the end of each one. And it became kind of this thing. There was another member of my crew, Avery, um, who who also was sending me videos. And he's like, Have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? Mm -hmm. And we would send videos back and forth. I would um I reached out to a couple uh finishers to ask some questions. 
um, and actually got to meet with one the week before Cocodona. I went out to Flagstaff for a week to just get my mind right and get ready. Mm. Um, and that was really helpful. Uh, there's so much specific to Arizona and the climate and the the mileage and, you know, um, nutrition and electrolytes and everybody has their own little thing. And there are so many little snippets of information um, that I got that I was like, oh, that's super helpful. Um, they put out a video about foot care. And, and foot care was one of the things that I feel like we we were on top of early and that helped make this race. I was pre-taping my feet on long runs mm -hmm. with Luke Tape. Um, the the Era Viper crew put out like a monthly video um, and they would use their sponsors like Darn Tough and Lakey Poles and would give like little tips and tricks. And the one they did on feet was taking Luco Tape off the roll and put it on wax paper in various sizes. Um, and so I had hundreds of those ready to go that were specific to my big toe, my middle toe, um, <laughs> so that I had a person dedicated to my feet that could take my shoes off, clean my feet, replace all that tape, address hot spots, and I was ready to go. Nice. Um, so I, th I think foot care was one of the absolute major things that went right in that race. Um, feet are fine. I have a couple broken blisters, but otherwise I feel pretty good. Right on. It's incredible, especially over 250 miles. And <laughs> I can't, I, I don't know how I, I, you know, things, things started going right after a while and I just started accepting it as opposed to questioning it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yep. That's, that's the way it needs to be, especially in a race that long. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> let's let's kind of dive a little bit into training because you know we we did some different things than what we did in the past you know yes. um it, it's uh it's i think coop said it best is you know 100 miles we're starting to understand training principles but it's really black magic when it comes to 200 plus miles <laughs> like, right yes. so and it's it's very individualistic um and so part of this i want to touch on cuz you brought up with me well, I see X, Y, and Z are doing this much or doing this many races. And uh, so I want to bring that into the conversation as well. But um, let's kind of just talk about how your training varied from our usual 100-mile training, if you wouldn't mind diving sure. a little bit into that. Yes. Um, we we changed the we, – we were doing time on feet mostly for my hundreds. Mm -hmm. We did change it a little bit to um, to some mileage-specific um, but then once we were hitting, I want to say 20 to 22 hours on feet, we changed it back. We dialed it back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I, and that is, that is kind of the, the gold standard that I've, that I've heard from other coaches as well. Um, funny enough, I ran into Jason Coop, um, out in Flagstaff the week before that was kind of fun just to That's be awesome. like, I saw him in yeah. van. I was like, Oh, Hey, I know you. <laughs> Thanks for your heating protocol. I've been using it for the last six <laughs> Um, but I, you know, as is the dirge of social media sometimes, um, I, I saw all these people putting up 100-mile weeks, doing back-to-back -back 50Ks, and, you know, you start to think, what am I not getting? You know, I, I'm, I'm training as hard for my 100, but not anymore, didn't seem like. I think my longest runs for a couple back-to-back 20-ish -back milers mm -hmm. on like a Saturday or Sunday. Yep. Um, and so I, I I did. I reached out on Training Peaks and said, hey, bud, <laughs> you know, just seeing all these other things. And you said, and I, and I will never forget it, you said, you are not them. <laughs> and I've held that with me through the finish. And I'm like, of course, he should have trusted coach. <laughs> 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 you know, I had just like this brief moment of, <laughs> I see, I, I, I'm unsure, right? Mm -hmm. This is yeah. kind of new territory. Um, and I mean, you were right. You were right. You're like, just <laughs> but, trust the process. But, yeah, <laughs> well, it, it's it's funny enough because you just mentioned Coop and on Coop's most recent episode, he talks about that that same thing is that people look into what others are doing and like they look on Strava, right? And they see right. their 
their training and they're like, should I just follow this blueprint? Should I just do exactly what this person did? And, you know, I mean, you know, can it work? Maybe. Right. But again, that's, that's somebody else. It's not you. And not the you. big thing that you and I had, and, and that began with that communication. And it's exactly that is communicating, right. Talking back and forth. Well, how are you feeling? Are you feeling recovered? Are you feeling okay? I want to make sure we're not doing too much. And as you said, when we kind of reached that 22 hour point, uh, you know, you're, you're like, well, starting to feel a little bit. Right. And that's when we kind of went back to time on feet and said, okay, let's control that stress a little bit better because, you know, when we get to the taper part, we don't want to have to taper so heavy just to make sure you're recovered. We want to get you to the, you know, the start line ready and feeling ready, right? Like right. we want you to to feel fresh. And so that was, that was huge. It's just that, that little bit of communication that we had. And it was a simple comment, you know, like I, I just, it, they're not you, right? Like they're not Ben and like Ben has a totally different history, right? Ben's coming from a totally different background. He's got different goals, Right. So it's like all these things that we have to consider when we look at your personal training. And then I've been asked, like, you know, for 100 miles, do you have like a blueprint plan, a, you know, a blueprint? And now when you step up to 200, it's like I said earlier, there is no blueprint. Right. Everybody's different. Like there were two of you out there. Right. There's there was two of you that you know I was coaching that were out there. Both of your trainings were completely different. If I put your training plan side by side, totally different totally different. Like, I mean, time on feet, different, you know, like long run, different. Everything was completely different. There was nothing that I could say. Maybe you guys had the same day before Coca-Dona, <laughs> but <laughs> aside from that, like it was completely different because I was looking at you at completely different individuals. You're training for the same goal. Yes, absolutely. I get that. But I mean, Ben Gons needed something that uh, who the next guest is Mike Reardon. Mike Reardon needed something totally different. And you both have different experiences and we have to rely on your strengths and weaknesses and work on your weaknesses and use your strengths to help build those weaknesses. So we did a lot of hiking. That was, that was, a. I mean, a you had a lot of hours of hiking. That was, you know, that was a big piece of your training. Um, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And that, that is my background is power hiking and, um, you know, through hiking Tahoe Rim Trail and being in the Smoky Mountains, I do a lot of hiking and I can put up, you know, it, with vert a, a 20 minute mile um, pretty consistently. And I knew that I was going to rely on that. And I did for Coca Dona. And I'll tell you, um, I felt great most of the time. Um, I, I, I think the first seven or 10 miles or so, there's a little bit of running you can do. Um, after that, it is mostly uphill the first 50 K and then, um, there's a few other spots once you reach the Coconino plateau that you can run, but by then you're pretty gassed at mm. 200 miles. or something. <laughs> Right. Right. So, so my strategy, um, when I came into crown King, so after the first 50 K I had banked about five hours, um, as a buffer from the cutoff and my crew decided that's a great buffer. Let's keep it there. Um, I don't want you to fall beyond that. Anything that you bank in the meantime to the next cutoff, um, as far as time goes is your nap time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so my goal was if I can push and I did all the math in my head cause I had hours and hours on my feet to figure <laughs> this out. Um, if I could push three miles an hour, um, after three hours, I banked an hour of sleep. Um, and so that bought me roughly a day uh, or one nap a day. Okay. Um, my, so my first nap was um, Whiskey Row, mile 77, I believe. Okay. Um, that's roughly 36 hours or so into the race. I was feeling pretty tired and pretty downtrodden. And um, my crew, love them. They opened the van door. They put me in the back of the van. Um, it felt like one of those kidnappings where people, you know, <laughs> they drive up in a van and like put it, put something over your head and gag you and throw you in the back and say, be quiet. And that's what they did. They put me in the back, told me to be quiet and go to sleep. Um, and I slept for 45 minutes and I woke up and I've never felt more revitalized after a 45. <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, you know, my, my girlfriend's like, you're moving better. Um, you sound better. Um, I had no idea. I've never done a race where napping and was involved. Mm -hmm. Um, once I bounced up from that first nap, I was like, okay, we can, if I can maintain this once a day, I think I can do this. Yeah. Um, it was such a, a spark. Um, Good. 
but yeah, so most of the time I was hiking yeah. and that, that Cocodona is pretty, pretty hikeable for like a three mile an hour, um, pace. Um, yes. there's, some, there's some pretty big climbs, but nothing that was, was that remarkable after the first day. Yeah. So I mean, like, uh, like you said, with that much hiking, it's, that's why we did so much hiking in your training plan. You know, it's, I mean, people run all the time and, you know, actually the, the vast majority of a 200 miler is going to be actually walking. So right. <laughs> practicing that and being as most efficient at that is, is huge. But another component of that was the weight of your pack, which, um, as we initially talked about, we had concerns Well, I had concerns because of how heavy, how much water that, that you were going to be required to carry, especially within that first bit of the course. Can you touch on that? Sure. Um, so the first part of the course, um, there there's only a couple aid stations and they're not crew accessible. Um, so you have to, you, you're required to have the capacity to carry four liters of water. Um, most people were carrying the capacity for six. So I think I left the start line with three liters um, because there's a place to camel up. I want to say at mile seven or mile 11, there's a place you could take as much water as you wanted. And so the goal was at mile 11, to take the pack off, get everything out. Um, I used the Solomon Advanced Skin 12 Great. Um, and was able to hold six liters in there. Um, now, I, can you, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't use the Solomon. Um, it's usually a two liter bladder in the back. Um, right. I bought a three liter bladder um, okay. that, that, that worked pretty well. Um, I then had two 500 milliliter flasks up front. That makes four. I had two 500 milliliter flasks in the side near my butt, basically okay. in the back of my hip. Yep. And then I had a quiver, a Solomon quiver that I okay. was using. Yeah. Uh, but since I had the poles out, I put the rest back there. Wow. And it worked. Yeah. It wasn't beautiful, but it worked. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not running a lot at this point either, so the the it wasn't really shaking a whole lot. But I I certainly tried it a few times before the race. Yeah. I also carried with me a one liter filter. Um, in case there was times, cause actually there, there's one other spot in the first 50 K that you can, they told you you could take one liter of water at a, at a water cash spot. And we got there and somebody had stolen a lot of the water cash. Oh, so they were only giving out half a liter oh, my gosh. to people. And I went through all six of my liters. Um, wow. at that water cash spot, there was a stagnant pond that I filtered from um and was and was fine once i got to lane mountain which is 34 i think 34 miles in okay um but after that i did not carry six liters of water <laughs> um i carried i carried maybe two on the back and then an electrolyte 500 and a water 500 soft okay. flask in the front did you ever run out with that amount i never did good. and and my crew and pacers were very good at hey ben have you taken a sip of some electrolytes lately <laughs> um, you know, kind of constantly getting me to sip electrolytes. They were they were very concerned with. Um, I had some Ziploc bags for each aid station that I would pack snacks with me, and they would evaluate how many calories I took out of that, <laughs> and, and and get on me or or pat me on the back for consuming too little or or too much or too little basically, yeah, or enough. Fair enough. No, no that's, no. that's that's fantastic. Um. Let's go back to something you said earlier. Your crew had a timetable. How did you go about creating that timetable? So we used uh, is Ultra Pacer, yes. I believe, yep. initially, okay. um, yep. and and kind of assumed that based on what I had been doing, I could roughly do three three miles an hour. Um, Cocodona cutoff is one twenty five. That's two miles an hour from the start to the finish if you don't do anything but walk. And so using that, we did a bunch of math and, and actually Ultra Pacer does it for you. So it's pretty yes. neat. Yeah. I, I used the finish time of 120 hours. Um, again, giving myself a buffer for a catastrophic event like an ankle roll or I need to sleep more or I'm you know throwing up and I need to really sit and replenish my electrolytes. Um, so we use that and then each um, each aid station had a cutoff. It was roughly the 125 hours divided up between the aid stations. And um, it's still on my phone. My save screen on my phone is each aid station, what mile it's at, how many miles to the next aid station and the cutoff. Nice. 
So they would, they would, um, we had a, we had a goal of 20 minutes per aid station because I know a lot of people who I talked to who had DNF'd, um, they just spent too long at the aid station. Mm -hmm. They sat down and didn't get up for a while. Yeah. You know, there were some times at three or four in the morning when there's a nice fire and you're eating a, you know, cheese quesadilla. Oh yeah. And you're just like, I don't, I don't no. need, I have a few, I, yeah, I have some minutes left. Why don't we make this 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but that adds up over 21 aid stations. Um, so we made a 20 minute um, aid station limit ish, you know, could be a little less, could be a little more. And then they would get me up and get me going. And, um, and then they would kind of let me know, Hey, great job today. You've banked this much time. You get an hour nap. Nice. Um, I wound up getting, so I had my first 45 minute nap at mile 77. And then roughly every 24 hours, I took an hour ish nap. Um, that did not work coming up on day five. I started hallucinating pretty poor, like badly. Um, I had some paranoid delusions that my crew was trying to kill me. Oh boy. Which, yeah, I I've talked to others since, and apparently that's normal, um, for Fair. 200 miles. So, okay. <laughs> but anyway, they, um, so at this would have been, I want to say it's Walnut Creek somewhere around the 200 mile mark. We're, we're approaching the last day. Um, mm -hmm. I came in early in the morning, was having severe deja vu, um, which was also apparently not uncommon with other runners. Um, and I wound up calling my mom, asking her that to make sure that my crew was not trying to kill me. She assured me they weren't and I should go to bed. And I said, <laughs> so they gave me an hour and a half nap. Um, and then later that day before the final 20 mile push up Eldon and down to the finish, um, I got an extra hour that day. So, because I didn't want any more paranoid delusions. Going <laughs> the final night. That's that's that sounds brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I think overall I slept five to six hours okay. over the course of that time. Um, and again, if it, to 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 those listening, if you've never done a race where you sleep, um, you'll be really surprised how much forty five minutes to an hour can do for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. It, it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. So. Um, I think, I think foot care, I think have figuring out sleep and we did it on the fly. Yep. And I think your advice was, you know, just don't sleep till the second day and don't sleep more than a couple hours. Yeah. And I agree because once I got four to six hours of sleep, my body shut down. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the other big thing was having crew and pacers, having people to tell me, yes, you know, eat yeah, this. Go to sleep. Talk about those. I, I definitely want to talk about your crew and pacers. There's one sure. other piece that I wanted to talk about in your training is that, and that was, you touched on the um, heat training. Um, mm -hmm. You want you to talk a little bit about the protocol we used. Sure. So we used, I believe the six week protocol. Yes. Uh, there's a six and a four week protocol, two. which basically involves us six and two, uh, six and two. Six and two. Right. Um, this involves basically for one week, I want to say between 15 and 25 minutes every day yep. after a run, I would, I would run in the park and I would drive to my gym and immediately turn the sauna on and get in it. And a lot of days there was already somebody else in there, which was great. So it was warmed up. Um, and I go sit in the sauna post run so that I would be at, at my hottest, I guess, internal body temperature. Yes. Correct. Um, and that was actually kind of hard. Yeah. I didn't think it would be as hard as it was. Um, you, you, you know, your heart rate goes up, you start mm -hmm. sweating profusely, obviously, but there's a little bit of anxiety that goes along with it. I found myself getting up and like walking around the hot box a little bit. Um, yeah. and, yeah. and at some points it, I set my timer for 25 minutes, but at 20, I was like, I'm done. I'm getting out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It really is. It was, um, and, and you know, this is, we should go back and, and actually Ben actually mentioned this, but, um, Coop's uh, training essentials. His book has both protocols in it. So if you're inquiring, wanting to know more, his book has it. So I'll put all of these resources in our show notes here. But those both both are there in there. But we should also say that um, this and you know Ben felt the anxiety and what really is going on is the heart is really working hard. So it's like it's it's like you're running a 5K. That's really what's happening internally. Your heart rate is so high, 
you're actually, you know, getting um, higher and higher and you can get into the anaerobic zone. Like your heart rate can get that high because what you're doing is actually you're heating up your internal. <laughs> that's really what we're trying. That's the adaptation um, is basically you're you're cooking yourself. And that's what happens in Arizona in that sun. So, you know, it, it's in the hopes of preparing you for that so that you're more efficient. Your body's more efficient at sweating and cooling itself. Um so, and, and how did you feel that, that acclimatization, you know, because that's, that's one of the things we can train the body for. How did you feel? Was it effective? I, I, I would say yes. Although we got very lucky, um, with our weather window, Good. Um, Good. first day it got up to uh, last year, it got up to like a hundred degrees. It was like 83. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't have any issues. That's awesome. That's in awesome. fact, I think I probably, I probably was a little overconfident because I was under hydrating mm. the first couple of days and, and got a little scolded from my crew about that. <laughs> um, but no, I, I would recommend it if you're going to go out for a hot race, I don't live in a hot place. Um, I live in a pretty humid place, but yeah. I also noticed at the end of it, um, you know, I can notice my heart rate's not as high on those final days of being in the sauna because of the adaptation and it working. So yeah. that was pretty cool to feel yeah. that. And it's, it's, it, and it's definitely something we kind of talked about the, you know, positives and negatives of doing six weeks versus two weeks and, you know, what, what we thought would be. So it was, it was a little bit tricky because you had, you know, we're in the maximum volume phase and we're not wanting to create too much extra fatigue. So that was kind of a conversation. So and I, I started to, and I told my girlfriend this, I was feeling pretty burned out at the mm -hmm. end of the max volume phase. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know it's not just the running and the sauna, but I have to drive to where the run is and I have to yes. drive to where the sauna is and I have to wait for the sauna to heat up. And right. Yeah. There is a lot. I mean, it's a lot of time. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, you know, I mean, but you committed to it and you stuck with it. You know? yes. So yeah, that's, that's the big thing. You know, it's, it's hard. That's why that six week one is tough too, because you're doing it first. And it, you know, it does start to vary. You don't go all, you know, six, seven days every week. Again, the protocol is in his in Coop's book, but you know it's still there's a lot of commitment and extra time to to the sauna. So, um, but yeah, thank you. Um, and then we you know we keep mentioning the crew and the pacers. Um, please talk about your selection process. How did you pick your crew and your pacers, and what roles did you assign them, and why? A lot of questions. Sure. There, so. <laughs> that's okay. okay um i i i didn't handpick a crew i threw out an instagram post it was like okay. who wants to free kick to arizona <laughs> who's coming with um me? <laughs> who's coming with me um i offered to pay for their flights and accommodations while they were out there um because it is i mean you're giving up five days to stare at my stinky feet you right know, yep every, every four hours so <laughs> i had to make it worth their while who wound up coming um was, was my girlfriend who i made the uh, crew chief Okay. And then um, a, a online Instagram friend who runs ultras. Um, his name's Avery. He's a professor. Okay. Um, he loves to crew. That's like one of his favorites. So thank goodness. <laughs> 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 um, and then I had two kind of wayward like newbies. Um, my friend Jonathan came out um, and my friend Tony. So Jonathan um, lives here in the mountains with me um, okay. and is a mountain biker. And was just kind of like he, yeah, man, I'll, I'll go out to Sedona and hang out with you in the dark. That sounds like fun. <laughs> and then uh, my friend Tony's from Indiana, and is just kind of an all around helper. So I had I had four people with me, and they were going to rotate crewing and um, um, pacing duties. Okay. And, and they were they were all for it. They were like, I'm gonna you know the ones who weren't ultra runners were going to get vests and they're going to get poles and start watching things. <laughs> they kind of auto assigned themselves into kind of into uh, tasks. Um, Jen knew that she could tell me to get up and shut up or be quiet and eat something because she's, you know, my partner and she can say those things to me. <laughs> um, but that was her job. Her job was to kind of be the manager over everything. Okay. And if she felt like something needed to get done, she could just say, then you're doing this. And I'd say, okay. <laughs> um, Avery with all of his, um, knowledge in in crewing was was the timekeeper was the um logistics person we have to be here at this time he's eating this many calories um we need to make sure he's doing this um so he was he was the big logistics person um tony became the de facto foot person so she um 
she read, oh gosh, the name of that book. Uh, the Crewing? Fix, the, the, no, Fix Your Feet. Fix Your Feet, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll put that um, in the notes too. <laughs> that, that's a great book. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of showed her all of the, the Luco Tape stuff. Um, I'm not, I'm not. Good websites for Luco Tape? Um, I just got it off Amazon. Okay. Well, so like, uh, for instance, KT, they've got like a zillion YouTube videos. Yes. Like, Here's yes, how you yes. use KT tape. Did, you, did Luco tape? I, no, I, um, and we'll have to find this. I thought about putting this so you could have it for the show notes. Um, that I, I don't know what her name is, but the woman they had on, on the Coca Dona, okay. um, like pre-race thing was, was so good I'll about see how if to I can do find it. that. Yeah. And, and that was kind of what I used. And that was the one about feet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one. Yeah. And they they recommend KT tape. Um, they didn't necessarily recommend Luco tape because it doesn't. Um, it's not as porous. And so if you sweat, you can get some issues. But I had been using it and I was just I wasn't going to change. They were saying um, I'm sorry. They were saying KT tape was better for that reason. And, correct. And there was also a different type. There's Luco tape P versus Luco tape yes. I believe. Uh, yeah, I think there's P and and T. I think. Um, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I don't even. I know. Uh, I was looking it up because I had to buy it for. I think I bought it for my son, and and like my physical therapist was like, make sure you get this one because of you know X, Y, or Z reason. But yeah, there right. is. You're right. There's two different types of Luco tapes. So yeah, I mean, definitely you know look into that. Um, and um, like there. Uh, it, I know a lot of people and actually on our Facebook group, on our team Facebook group, um, a woman just did cruel jewel, but she used Luco tape for her feet and she's had, you know, blister problems forever and a day. And she said no problems in, uh, in cruel jewel 100 with Luco tape. So a testament to, uh, to using the taping. Um, so, uh, yeah. and I'm glad for you too, especially because that, that long, your feet, you know, I mean, I remember in Bigfoot, I had one early on on my heel and we were just like, you were taping it every time just to kind of keep me from it getting worse and me, you know, mourning about it every time I got into an aid station. <laughs> so it's, it, it can be a game changer, but yeah, please um, continue. Yeah. Um, so Tony became kind of a de facto uh, foot person, um, podiatrist in, in residence. <laughs> Um, and did a great job. I mean, she really did. And then um, Jonathan, Jono, um, was just kind of, what else do you need, man? Can I charge your headlamp for you? Can I charge your earbuds? Um, he was he was just out there to kind of have a good time. Nice. And, and he did a great job. But he paced a lot. Um, Jen, my partner, paced a lot. Um, Avery paced as well. So they kind of rotated duties. But I, I would say... Foot care and having a crew were two of the biggest reasons I was able to finish because, you know, I'm, I'm walking in day two to whiskey row. I am delirious. I don't know what I really need. And like I said, they, they're like, take your contacts out, put on this eye mask, lay down, take your clothes off, go to sleep. Yeah. Don't think you have nothing else to do, but go to sleep. And in the mean, in the interim, they're doing things with my vest. They're getting clothes ready. Um, they wake me up. They put clothes on me. They tape my feet. Uh, Jen is my pacer. And she's like, we're going this way. And I'm like, okay. I, I have no idea what the next section looks like. I don't know what the, we're about to hit the granite dells. And I don't know that. Um, and and it, it just, having people there to show you and tell you where to go and what to do was monumental in helping me achieve it. I can't speak enough about having at least one or two people there with the wherewithal to give you those directions so many questions just popped up. Um, <laughs> um, let me go back to one more thing about training. Um, you got to go out on course. Um, we did a, a long training weekend, a training camp, if you will. Let's talk about that a little bit. What did that look like? How did that help? Sure. I went out for a, an extended weekend, and my big thing was to try and hit, you know, people talk about Coca Dona 250 in the first 50K. Um, it's hot, it's, it's exposed. There's a lot of scrambling. Um, and then a lot of people talk about the, um, the next part, which is crown King down to Arasta Creek and up to camp Kippa, I believe it is because okay. that climbs pretty brutal. 
and you've only seen your crew once in, in 60 miles. Um, so I just wanted, for me personally, when I get exposed to the environment, it helps ease my anxiety. Um, yes, I did part of medical school out in Arizona. I was kind of familiar, but I really wanted to see what the trail was like, what it felt like on my feet. I wanted to use gaiters because I don't use gaiters very often. Sure. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to feel the dirt. I wanted to carry six liters and, you know, just see what that feels like on my body. Yeah. Um, the less things to me that are novel on race day, the better. Um, so I got out, I did, I did probably 15 miles of the, of the first part of the course, um, had some gut issues, was going to do the entire second part of the course, but didn't did, I think I did 20 miles that day, but I got to see Lane mountain and I got to see crown King and I got to see the climb out of crown King. Um, and again, I, I think that was great because when I got there on race day, I could look around and say, I know where I am. I know what this feels like. This isn't new. It's not a problem. So for me, having that sort of um, just internal knowledge about what it's going to feel like and smell like um, makes makes my anxiety go away a little yeah, bit. Sure. So I'm super glad I went out there. Uh, some people went out and they did the first like 60 miles of the course. If they have, if you have the capacity to do that, um, and your coach allows it, sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it would have been difficult to do the first 50 K being my pace. Um, it would have taken me all day and there were not a lot of water right. um, streams right. to fill up on. So I would have had to camel more than six liters and that yeah. doesn't seem practical. Yeah. Um, so I basically did an out and back um, to when I felt like I was like, okay, we're reaching my limit. I got to turn around. I know there's a water crossing over here. I can fill up on. Um, and then I went out, to Flagstaff the week before Cocodona and got to see some of the Mount Eldon climb. Um, and that was good too, just to see the difference yeah. in, in, in Phoenix to Flagstaff. But if it, I, I still agree. And I've heard other people say this, if you're going to go scout any part of the course, um, the first 50 K is good or the second 50 K. Okay. Cool. And if you're not familiar with Arizona and the, the, the arid dry heat, um, it's good to kind of just feel it and just see what it's like. Yeah. Get a sense for it. Cool. So you're overwhelmed on race day with with all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, two questions that popped up when we were talking about crew. I'm sorry to, to hop around here, but um, no, we did a, a Zoom call with, uh, uh, what do we had? We had two of your crew and pacers that jumped on that call. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about a few things and we talked about the the crewing book i had mentioned the the crewing for ultra running book yes. did you guys end up getting that i have no idea if they got that or not uh, yeah, okay <laughs> um i'll put that book in the show notes because i think it's a fantastic resource we're gonna have a ton of books in the show notes but i think it's yes. a good resource for i'm for I, yes and, you know let me ask them now that, now that i'm okay. curious about that <laughs> um then uh the other question that i had um so did you kind of make up, um, I know you had a separate zoom call with your crew members and you can kind of, if you'd like talk about what that meeting entailed, did you have a write up or anything? Um, you know, these are specific things that I'll look for or want or need you to make sure that are done. Did you have any of that? So actually, um, because shout out to Avery, um, who again, he's done this so much. He put, he put together a Google doc, mm -hmm. uh, it was like, what does Ben like, you know, yeah. um, that kind of changed throughout the race, but <laughs> you know, I, I typically like, uh, whole real food, mm -hmm. uh, burgers and pizza and quesadillas. Um, I tend to want ice drinks, sure. um, regardless of how hot or how cold it is. Um, so he made this whole list of let's talk about things you like. Let's talk about what happens when you get to an aid station. Do you need support? Mm -hmm. Or do you need somebody to be kind of harsh with you and tell you how it is? You know what I mean? If, yeah. Um, and so he was really good about getting that, um, kind of finding those angles in, in my psyche. Um, again, having somebody who knows you in an ultra environment. So Jen had crewed me for my my first hundred. And so she's very aware of, of kind of what I need in that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, this changed. I really thought I was like, I'm going to need real food. If you guys can get to a McDonald's, get me a cheeseburger, um, Taco Bell, even better. <laughs> After the first day, I was I was pretty dehydrated and just chewing wasn't a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, and overnight, you know, we went to our first aid station. It was kind of a blunder um, there because this was the first time they've had access to me. It's the first time all of the four of them together were trying to give me what I needed. It was a lot of people asking questions and I was just answering them and not doing what I needed to do, which was sit down, be quiet, eat food and get out. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, so I ate like half a black bean burger and a Diet Coke at mile 37 and still <laughs> had the whole night ahead of me. Um, so I thought about it overnight. And, you know, when I got back to them, I was like, guys, Honestly, I think liquid is going to be a way to go for me for a little while um, because it's easy to consume calories. So I had some insurers mm -hmm. and some protein drinks, um, switched over to a lot of uh, goo chews and, and just goos in general. Um, and I did that for the majority of the race. I got solid food when I had time and felt good about it, but I was I was doing liquid calories a lot of the time and I, and I just didn't expect to do that. Gotcha. Um one other thing um so yeah for for hellbender i had two people one had been around me for part of bigfoot so he had some experience with with you know pacing at least not so much crewing but they were going to crew me and and his wife was a part of this and she's my physical therapist but you know not the most experienced in crewing so i gave them like you know here are things to do Right. Like, here's a list of things that like, make sure you grab my trash, make sure I've got new water bottles, make sure like I have my nutrition, like, you know, don't, don't ask me how I'm doing, ask me what I need. Right. Those type of questions. Um, so, um, the other part of it though, is I gave them a list of things that they might need, right? Like, cause they're coming to an event that like you had, you had some crew members that were very unfamiliar with an ultra, and I said, here's a list of things I would suggest you bring to make sure you're comfortable and have what you need for the day. Did you do anything of that sort? We did. And I think we talked about this at, at the meeting um, that, that we had on the Zoom call. Yeah. Um, and, th and these guys, um, the ones that aren't familiar are, um, and I don't think they'll mind this term, dirt bags. Um, mm -hmm. In a way, they'll go out for an event. As long as they have a car and a tent and a sleeping bag, they're fine. <laughs> um, so it was more or less, hey, you guys need to be hydrating as well. Um, I need to make sure that you guys are eating and sleeping. You, yeah. you, I don't need all four people at every aid station. Um, so make sure you guys are getting sleep. Um, we, we went over, I went over a lot of the gear that I had because they wanted some gear. If they were going to be pacing, they're like, well, I need shoes. I need poles. I need a sure. vest. Um, so we did a lot of that. And then again, Avery really helped out with kind of telling everybody, okay, you've been out long enough. Here's the hotel, go sleep. <laughs> um, um, and we had, we had two vehicles between us, um, which really helped because four people in one vehicle, I think would have been kind of tricky with, well, somebody needs to stay here for Ben so he can sleep, but you two need to go to bed. So Two vehicles was great. Um, that was a happy accident that somebody rented an extra vehicle we didn't know about um, <laughs> until later. But but yeah, I, I tried to make sure that the crew was taking care of themselves. And there was a little bit of inner crew bickering that happens. And I think that's something that's natural amongst four people who haven't been around each other ever. <laughs> and now we're going to spend the next 125 hours together. Um, but everybody was super cordial and it worked out. And I just couldn't be happier. Um, I think I may have made a, a convert out of uh, Jonathan. Um, he may be doing an ultra coming up. And in fact, he may be contacting you um, <laughs> for coaching. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that the crew was was well taken care of. And, and right, that they're taking care of themselves because yeah. they can't if they're not in yeah. their right mind. Yes. Um, now, in that situation, you and I'm trying to remember, you said Jennifer was crew chief? Yes. So when, when there was bickering and you may not have had privy to this, but like, did Jennifer kind of take the reins and say, Hey, you know, we need to get our stuff together. I liked, um, if you're familiar with the office, mm -hmm. uh, the show, um, I was like, you know, the, the Scranton branch is the crew. <laughs> um, 
Avery is Michael Scott. Yeah. He's going to run most of this. Yeah. But if there's ever any questions, Jen is David Wallace. And okay. David Wallace has the final say in everything. So <laughs> that's kind of how I broke it down. Um, because Avery was so on with logistics and was like, I want to make, um, I'm sure you've seen these um, elaborate Cocodona course uh, maps that have like, okay, your, your, your time is right here. Here's where it's going to be nighttime for you. Here's what you're expected. And here's where your actual time is. And it's very elaborate. Um, he loves that stuff. Jen is more of the mindset of I'll roll with the punches. And when some adversity comes, I'll deal with it then. In fact, um, I had to stop talking about Cocodona with my partner um, <laughs> for a while because she's just like, I can't stand to hear you talk about this it's just <laughs> too much. It's too much. It's overwhelming. Um, so I was like, okay, so here's the deal, Jen, like you get, you know who I am when I'm a hundred miles in and not feeling right. Um, sure. If you need to throw in your authority to change something, go ahead and do it. Otherwise Avery's kind of running the show. Um, and, and that happened a few times, um, especially when I started thinking Jen was trying to kill me. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was that was basically it. Avery, because of all of the crewing he had done, um, I was like, "You are you're pretty much in charge." Jen knows what I feel like when I get sleep deprived. So if she says anything that seems counterintuitive, we're going to default to what she says. Yeah. Um, and that seemed to work for the most part. Is Jen a runner herself? She is. Uh, she's completed several hundred mile races. Um, cool. And has, you know, long distance backpack, the Colorado Trail, the AT, the Finger Lakes Trail, you name it, she's done it. Um, so that, and that's why I try. Gotcha. Um, when you, this is something I like to talk to, to people about, and I'm always curious, when this idea came before you registered, did you have this conversation with Jen? to say hey this is my idea this is what i'm thinking this is going to be a big part of our lives did you have that conversation no because we weren't um we weren't dating at that oh, particular fair enough uh, fair enough so it was it was kind of challenging because i almost felt like i was proposing when i said hey will you crew me for coconut <laughs> <laughs> because i know how much of a commitment that is of course yeah um I, I don't think I realized how big of a deal this was going to be over the last year. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we've, we've done this before where she's helped crew me or I've crewed her in something and, and she's good about putting up boundaries to say, you know what? Uh, we have a group text that we call the Coco Locos and it's me and her and the rest of the crew. And she mutes that uh, for her own safety. And, um, so she she knew going in what it was going to be, I think. Um, and and I, I kind of gave her a little bit of a, here's what happens, Jen. You help me get across this finish line and I'll never talk about Cocodono again. <laughs> so so her motivation was always to get me up, give me food, get me on the darn track to keep me going so I could finish. So she didn't have to talk about it again. <laughs> And, and that's, you know, that's love, right? That's, yeah. that's, I love you in this endeavor. It is a lot. Um, I'll, I'll do as much as I can. Sure. So, yeah. um, you know, shout out to her and the rest of the crew, but um, she will never have to hear about it again. <laughs> uh, something that struck me and, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to talk about this piece when we had that meeting, that Zoom call prior to the race day, you had said you have a safe word. Um, and if, if it got to that point, you would use that safe word. Um, I don't want to know the safe word. I, that's your <laughs> business. Um, <laughs> what I do want to know is like, what was in your mind that it would have to come to it for you to say that safe word? What, what was your, what would you envision happening for it to say, I have to say this word where, where was that point for you? That would have been, I, I fell and broke my ankle. Okay. Um, I, I can't stop throwing up, um, some irreparable damage has occurred. Okay. Uh, and I've spent hours. It was going to take a lot. Yeah. 
It was going to take a lot. I, um, I, I told the crew after I told them the safe word, um, <laughs> you know, before I get there, I want you to do two things. Um, I want you to tell me left on Birch, which is the final turn you take before the finish. And I had just kept envisioning in my mind yeah. because if I hear that, I will get up and walk a few more steps. The other thing was, um, I have, this is a strange, uh, like trinket. I have a, um, my dad's camping spoon. Okay. It's just like a plastic camping spoon that he had that he wrote his name on. And it's says like, you know, one spoonful equals two tablespoons. Cause he was that kind of backpacker. <laughs> um, and I kept it in my first aid kit and I told them if we get close to me saying this stuff, take it out and show it to me. Um, and it never came close to that. Good, good. Uh, oh, it, did I cry a lot? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, rightly so. That's, I mean, there's, well, there's so many reasons to cry out there. I mean, yes. you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's all personal stuff. So, um, and I hope to touch on a little bit of it, but um, it, it, like, you know, just to go back to the safe word, it made me a little bit nervous at first that like you had already discussed it with your crew. So it wasn't something that I wanted to dive into, but it just made me nervous that there was like, well, there's this, you know, I'm, there's always that possibility. Right. But it, it just made it put it out there that like, you know, this it's in your head, right? Like you've got this word to use that's going to call it you know, which like made me just like, oh, like, you know, I, I, I didn't want you to have that scapegoat, right? I didn't want you to have that, that key, like the, to say, this is pull the plug. This is the emergency record, yeah, yeah. you know, like that's what it, I was just like, oh, I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, but you saying that, what you said, exactly what you said, it had to be something irrecomprehensible, you know, irre I couldn't get through it. That's basically what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it and, and that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, it, you know, and it was something I, I may have like wanted to pull you on the side and, and talk to you about prior just to make sure we were on the same page. Because like I said, I just didn't want you to have that little bit of excuse, right? Like there can't yes. be even that little bit of an excuse to say, I'm pulling this word. So, uh, but uh, like you put it succinctly and that's exactly what I was hoping you would say. So kudos. <laughs> yes. It, it was, it, yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of vis visualization had happened prior to the race. Um, mm -hmm. You know what's kind of funny is as I'm getting, I got maybe 160 miles in. It was a uh, Schnebly Hill where I thought, barring a catastrophe, this is going to happen. Right. And then I started having these intrusive thoughts of rattlesnake bite. Oh boy. Or we're going to, we're going to sprain our ankle so bad on this next climb. And so I started getting overly cautious about everything. <laughs> I've never had that before. That was really interesting because yeah. it's just like, no, you're going to do it, but maybe a tree falls on you. You <laughs> never know. <laughs> well, it's, you know, a level of fatigue sets in too, right? Like, you know, oh, your yes. brain is just, it's starting to think of things that could happen to being an excuse for you to be able to stop because it's just like, I've been going forever, dude. Like when's this going to end, you know? So it's, right. I think that's part of the psychological piece of this, which is, you know, it's, it's another whole nother subject and increasingly, increasingly interesting to hear as we push our bodies to these, you know, these new distances. Um, but you know, I, like you touched on, you know, the crying piece of this, let's talk about some of the highs and some of the lows. Um, and you can start with whatever you want and you share whatever you want as much as you want. So either side, you know, let's, let's hear yeah. about some of those. Um, I'll, let's go chronologically. Um, okay. I know, I know starting out, I knew, I knew the first 50 K was not going to be fun. Um, everybody talks about just get through the first day and this can happen. Um, so I was pretty head down. This is going to suck. It's going to be, but it'll be fine. I've, yeah. I've hiked this before. I've done this vert before. It's not that bad, but I got to like mile 13 and I'll tell you what happened is Jen had given me a, a cheeseburger from McDonald's that I kept with me and I was getting ready to eat it and it was in my hand and I'm kind of jogging along and it flies out of my hand and it lands in the dust I'm just demoralized because I'm so hungry and I'm so excited to have this cheeseburger and I pick it up and I literally just kind of blow it off and put the bun back on it. 
just eat the crunchiest cheeseburger of my life. <laughs> but I'm like, no, this is this is important. I'm going to eat this. Um, there was another point after Crown King. So I kind of had a bad first aid station experience um, when I finally got to the crew. Again, nobody's fault. We're all trying to do the best we can. Yeah. But I, I left there thinking, oh, God, if this is how the next few aid stations go, I'm not I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry. I'm tired. It's getting cold now. Um, that morning at like three in the morning, my battery and my headlamp goes out mm -hmm. and I have an extra one, but I can't, I don't have the dexterity with my gloves on. Right. And so I, I have to take, well, I have to take my Lakey, um, like the, like the, the straps off mm -hmm. and I have to take my gloves off. Now my hands are cold. I can't feel my hands. I can't change this battery. I look up. It's actually first light almost by like 430. And I'm thinking to myself, I just spent half an hour replacing this battery. There's no way I can do this for four more nights. Like I'm just not having a good time. And I, I'm, an, I'm at the bottom of what is about to be a really big climb in the morning. Um, and I just felt I was pretty demoralized. And then um, that same night, um, I, I have an issue with um, I can get some some butt chafe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can really start to throw my race because it just gets worse and worse. And I had been doing all sorts of wipes and lubing and being really cognizant of that. And, um, and I was like, oh no, of course this happens day one. I got four more days of <laughs> my legs moving back and forth. Oh. Um, I actually took two pieces of Luco tape that I had with me. Um, and that solved that issue. But again, I was just like, this is night one and everything's falling to pieces. Yeah. You know, I, I got to do this for four more days. We're at mile, you know, 50. Um, and, and yeah, the sunrises helped. Um, but there were, there were a couple times, uh, so day, day two happens and I'm, and I'm feeling better. I, uh, I finally sleep. That was a huge game changer. Taking that first nap, you know, once you realize that you can really rejuvenate yourself and and, and come back, not a hundred percent, but maybe seventy five percent, keep going was very was very motivating. Um, on day night three, we're in Sedona, and I think that we're supposed to do a two hundred foot climb up Sedona, and it's like a two thousand foot climb. And I'm climbing and I'm just, it's in pitch black and I cannot fathom why we are continuously going up. <laughs> and it won't, you know, you get angry. Yeah. You get angry at the course. You get angry at the fact that your crew didn't tell you about the climb. And you, you just have to succumb to the fact that, well, this is what it is and you better keep going. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the, the last major pitfall was day five when I thought my crew was trying to kill me. Mm. Um, there was a controlled burn the night before that, that the wind blew all the smoke um, over into the race course. Mm. So I'm sleep deprived, number one, and now I'm inhaling all this smoke. Um, we're on a forest service road. It's so thick that all I can do is keep my headlamp poured in down at the forest service road and follow my pacer because I can't, everything else is disorienting. Um, and I'm seeing things in the trees so I get I get I get to that um, that aid station where I think people are trying to kill me. I take a nap. I wake up, and now I've kind of like lost my my compass. Um, I I'm eating food and I'm thinking to myself, I'm out here. To, I'm doing like 50 days in 50 states or something. Like I've forgotten <laughs> on a race, right? Like you right. just it's just not there. Yeah. Um, your cognition is so so off. Um, I I start running that morning. Um, and things kind of come back together for me a little bit and I take my second nap and I'm better. Um, I remember we're climbing Eldon, the final climb of the race that night and it's all starting to hit me and I just start losing. I'm just crying. Um, you know, I wish my dad could be here to see me. Um, I can't believe that I'm doing this, you know, as somebody who ran his first marathon, 10 years ago and is now accomplishing this. I've been dreaming about this since I signed up for it. Um, it's such an emotional experience. 
you come down into Flagstaff and I know I have to take a left on Birch and I fantasized about what that looks like <laughs> for, for months. I fantasized about what that looks like. Um, I never expected it to be 3 a.m. <laughs> and, and I feel like crap, you know, right, right. In, my, in my fantasy, it's like noon and everybody's cheering me on and having a great <laughs> Um, but I take that left on Birch and I am just, it's in the finisher photos. Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotion there. Um, and I, I'm still decompressing from it. I'm still, you know, I call this and I've heard other people call this part after a long adventure where you're kind of away from society, um, re-entry. Mm -hmm. I'm going through re-entry right now mm -hmm. or I have to go to a job and I have to go to the bank and go to the grocery store um, where my sole focus for the last 117 hours was eat, sleep and walk. Yeah. Um, so that's something I think people should talk about a lot more too, is, is giving yourself some time and some space to process all the emotions that you go through in a race like that. Um, I, I got done at 3.30 a.m., on Saturday and I was at work Monday morning and I wish I would have given myself more time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it's been two weeks now and I feel a lot better. So good. Good. Um, you know, people say they do these long events because you can experience a lifetime of emotion and, you know, 120 hours. And I, yeah. and I absolutely believe that. And I got everything out of it that I wanted to get out of it. Good. And I was on ultra sign up on Monday. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can talk about that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you don't mind, um, perhaps some, some lessons or, or takeaways that you brought from this things you learned, sure. um, things that changed you know, or changed you. Um, I, I don't question or I won't question a physical and mental endeavor in the future. I don't think as much because my last, you know, I ran a hundred mile race in 2022 and it was a flat hundred mile race. And the next big thing I did was Cocodona 250 and I felt pretty darn good doing it. So I think that, you know, I have a lot of things on the horizon that I'm looking forward to, and I don't think I'm going to question my ability as much as I would have. The other thing is I've encouraged so many other people to go out and do something not necessarily like this, but I, I'm a regular person, <laughs> uh, you know, and I think a lot of us think that we're all just regular people. Anybody can do this race. Um, yes, I've had a lot of time to build up to it um, and you do need that training, but I, I, I've, I talked to another runner the other day. And she's like, that's so great. I, you know, I can only imagine I can do that someday. And I just looked at her and I was like, you can, you can absolutely do this. Um, it's a generous enough cutoff time um, with the proper training and crew and nutrition. It's very doable. Um, I think that if I do something to this caliber again, I will want a crew. I want a crew. I want pacers. Um, I think that's a non-negotiable for me. It was just too valuable. I don't think I would have the the wherewithal to be able to do it orchestrated by myself. Sure. Um, and foot care. <laughs> foot care was, I mean, that was, I had not done that before. Um, my foot care was corrective and not preventative. It was, I would run with just socks on. And when things happened, they happened. Um, Having having pre-taped my feet for several long runs to learn what I liked with my feet as far as taping goes. Um, and then every 30 or 40 miles, we would take my shoes and socks off. They would uh, wash my feet with like a baby wipe. Um, they would take off tape that looked like it was coming off, reapply it after doing like an alcohol swab to get rid of the adhesive. Um, I mean, that that was great. That that was one of the biggest things for the whole race. So invest in foot care um, and good socks. I used, I used right socks, W-R-I-H-T. Mm -hmm. um, I've also used darn toughs, um, but both of those were fine. I think I brought 10 pairs of socks and I think I used all of them. <laughs> um, and then I, my shoes, I, 
I uh, used Topo's Ultra Venture, mm -hmm. and I had I had two pairs that I alternated. One got 125 miles, the other got the next 125 miles, just so they weren't completely worn out. They were mm -hmm. a little new. Um, I also did bring a half size up um, that I did use the final couple of days because my feet did get pretty swollen. Good. But foot care is something I had not really uh, paid a lot of attention to, and I'm so glad I did. Anything else that you want to mention about the race itself? Call Aaron if you're going <laughs> to think about doing it. <laughs> Thank you for that plug. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, um, it, it was, I'm still again, kind of, uh, processing the fact that I completed it. Um, mm -hmm. it's going to take a while. I think it's amazing that you have two runners who both went out and did, I think mm -hmm. he did it in a couple hours faster than I did he as well. Just in front of you, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it is a life changing experience and I would recommend it to anybody who's thinking about going for that distance. Um, like I said, it's, it's a generous enough cutoff time um that you can you can be pretty slow and still make it as long as you keep pushing um the aid stations are really good the volunteers were all wonderful um i i never felt off course at any particular point there was enough markings um and you get to see phoenix prescott sedona flagstaff sometimes at night but <laughs> it's yeah. still it's a beautiful course they have excellent photography i just saw all the pictures that they uploaded um yeah, just a a life changing experience. So cool. Um, lastly, you had mentioned uh, you're already on ultra sign up. <laughs> what's what's Ben thinking? <laughs> uh, so I'm supposed to. I have a, a plan to climb Denali in 2025. Okay, um, that's usually a June thing. But the a couple of the people I uh, made friends with on the Cocodona course are doing the Triple Crown of two hundreds. Oh wow! <laughs> so so Tahoe in June, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Bigfoot is is later in July, uh, August. Yeah, and August. then Moab's in October. October, mm -hmm. I think. So I'm looking at it. I think <laughs> that's a lot. That um, a lot. Yeah, it's expensive too. That's very it's expensive. expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive. Um, I haven't. I've I've kind of floated it by the crew. It, you know, what was great is they had such a good time. Yeah. That like, yeah, man, you want to do this again? <laughs> like, maybe. Yeah. 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 So, um, we'll see. We'll yeah. see what's, what's out there. I like the 200 distance. Yeah. But it's, it is, it's a journey race. It's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, my experience at Bigfoot is, uh, very endearing. Um, I can't, you know, talk about how much I love that course in the Pacific Northwest, you know, and just being out there that long. Um, you know, the, the one that really speaks to me is Tour de Jantz over in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's the, the one that really calls my name. If I was to step up at that distance again, it would be go over to Italy and do Tour de Jantz. But, um, you know, I, it's, um, I've had runners that have done Tahoe and loved it. Um, and I've, um, I've had runners that have done Moab, you know, and the thing you have to remember about Moab is it's closer to that at 250 because <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's 240, but and that's a heck of a way to finish it, but you know it's uh, like you said they're they're doable and they're manageable if, as long as you uh, as long as you stay on top of it. You know it's so it's uh it's cool. Still, still can't believe I'm saying things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two two hundred is manageable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I was having a conversation with my father today, and he's like, "You know, you're a bad example for your athletes." And I said, "Yeah, I tell them not to look and see what I do; just <laughs> do their own thing." <laughs> so. <laughs> But that's that's super cool that you're even thinking about that. Um, you know, you mentioned you've been two weeks into recovery. Um, and uh, you know, we we've we're just giving you some time because that's what the body really needs is that time to to really recover from this and, and down to the cellular level. You know, some people try to rush back and that's just not the way to not the way to do it. I mean, of course, if you were doing the triple count, it'd be a different story. <laughs> but you know, uh, after something like you just did. If we have the time, you might as well take it. So I appreciate you taking that time off. I I, I questioned you once and it won't happen again. Um, <laughs> I'm, and I'm honestly, I'm so happy to have the downtime. I'm really trying to make <laughs> make use of it and, and not push myself. I haven't done any weightlifting or anything either um, since I've been home. So right on, I'm right on. just hanging out. How can people find you? 
How can they find me? Yeah, social media. Oh, yeah. Um, my handle on social media is um, dr underscore bentendo. So Dr. Bentendo, because I love Nintendo. <laughs> um, and if you want to talk Cocodona, um, my girlfriend won't let me. So please reach out. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions or get people in contact with... Um, other runners because I know a big saving grace for me was talking to people who had done it. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, again, just so many tiny little details that you don't think about or that, that mm -hmm. they can help you with. So. Uh, that's beautiful, man. I, I think people can pull a lot from this conversation. So Ben, congratulations on finishing Coca Dona 250. It's a it's outstanding. So happy for you and proud of you, of course. Thank but, you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I called you three years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> you. Um, thanks for all you do. Oh, thank you, buddy. My next guest is Mike Reardon, and Mike is here. He's wearing his Coca Dona 250 cap. Told me you can't take it off of him. It's sutured on. <laughs> well earned. It's a beautiful hat. But Mike, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Couldn't be better. He's lying. <laughs> 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 no i'm kidding he, he actually is doing pretty good <laughs> he's ready to run he says um, I, I am for sure <laughs> well mike has another 200 miler already lined up which is what are we nine weeks out is that am i thinking right how many weeks out? oh we? i think i got a little more time than that it's in september okay september. early september oh, forgive me yeah, yeah. Uh, so all right cool that's that's much better <laughs> Yeah. Uh, don't, don't freak me out. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I had in my mind and I mentioned this in training peaks that, uh, you know, it was, and maybe, no, I can't, I was so tired when I, when we texted, but I think I fat fingered like three instead of two. Uh, yeah. But I, I think also I was getting confused because people were, I think we had even talked about like, you know, he said, didn't you see that came out with like the Arizona 300? And I was like, yeah. oh, God, like Mike's going to do that. <laughs> I mean, you never know, but not yeah, right you now. Never know. You never know. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, full disclosure, neither Ben nor Mike, uh, we have not had a conversation since their um, event. So we're kind of debriefing as we go and catching up. So yep, yep. Um, this is a, a you know, open, honest conversation. I, I really wanted to hear from them. I didn't prepare questions. I just wanted to ask them and hear from them and, and hear their experiences. So, um, but before I begin with the Coca Dona, <clears throat> Mike, take us back. Where did all this craziness begin? Uh, well, I've been running all my life, even since probably starting in middle school. Um, I wasn't really a coordinated kid, so I wasn't great at basketball. I wasn't great at football or anything, but uh, I could run. And uh, so I've been running all my life. Actually, I was a lot faster <laughs> in my <laughs> early years. <laughs> high school, I was I was pretty good in high school. The mile, the two mile, uh, cross country, and then it sort of fell off. And in college, a little bit um, started gaining some weight, um, but then I picked it back up again uh, in my thirties, uh, running five k's, ten k's. Eventually, worked up to a half marathon. Um, and then during 2020, the COVID year, um, really just, I saw the the Barkley documentary, thought it was this crazy thing. I never had heard of it, ultra running. So I decided to give it a try um, and I uh, scheduled my first uh, 50K that year. And uh, which one was that? Really? South Splitter. Okay. Yeah. So. Not an easy first first fifty no, k. Not by any stretch. No, absolutely <laughs> not. What what made you pick that one? Um, it was it was pretty local, not not too far away. So, um, and then uh, I just like the, the beauty of the the mountains around that area. So, yeah, um, it was it was good, but yeah. um, and then just blew up from there. Actually, I mentioned to my wife, um, I was like, no, it's not going to like to wreck it run a hundred mile or one time. And she was like, there's no way you could run a hundred miles. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd had to prove her wrong. And she hasn't really said that since, but uh, huh? yeah, it's just been a, a, 
you know, fit for me, I think. And, yeah. and it's been a great, great, great experience. Great. I just, I just love it so much. Well, like you went from 50 K to what, where did you go from 50 K? Did you have a progression or did oh, you like, but yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, so uh, I moved from 50 K to 50 mile. I did the Leadville 50 mile, okay. um, yeah, which was super hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, eventually after that, I did the Yeti 100 the following year and I've done about seven 100 so far. That's incredible so. in such a short span. And you've done some gnarly ones too. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. A few of the others that you've done just so people get an idea of your background. Um, well, I've done, uh, Yeti 100. Um, I've done Rim to River 100 three times now. Um, I've done the, uh, Grindstone 100, the Bear 100, Hellbender 100. Um, did I say bear 100? Uh, no. Yes. But if you didn't, <laughs> okay, then then bear, there it was. The bear 100. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, I uh, might take these things off. But um, So one of the things I've been trying to do is uh, I, I've been using the, the, uh, the Hard Rock 100 qualifier list as sort of a just a, a list of races I might like to do. I might never get into the race itself, but I think that the, the races on that list sort of um, speak to me. Um, I really like challenges. I'm not a fast runner. I'm not a front of the pack runner, but I have a lot of grit. So I can, if it's a long cutoff, I can, I, I believe I can grit it out and finish the race. Um, so um you know a lot of those races sort of have that same quality right it's, they're very tough but they give you a good amount of time to finish so if you can just grit it out and finish it's that's what i like to do and a very hard mountainous uh where do you think that's so that, from where where does that piece of mic come from where is that grit what is what is, is that something that you think you learned or was that something that was instilled or was it something that was built? um i think yeah i, I definitely learned it uh, well, it's it was definitely still throughout my life. I've been working, you know, all my life since I was a teenager. Um, but, you know, not, nothing comes easy. So uh, I think that's what one thing about running that really uh, attracted me to is, is that the more you work, the harder you work, the better you can become at it. Um, you might not become the fastest, but you'll definitely become better. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, you don't have to have like the all the special talents to do it, but if you want to get out there and try um, and work hard, you can become better. So, what made you connect with a goofball like me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I mean, it, it, I did a lot of research actually when I was looking for for coaches, um, and there's there's a lot of coaches out there, mm -hmm. and you know, I did my research. But one thing that really just sold me was I was listening to your podcast and you just, I was like, this guy gets it. Um, <laughs> it this stuff is, is super important um, to me personally. It's, yeah. it's um, something you can't explain really. And then listening to you talk about uh, running on your podcast, I was like, this guy gets it. He's very knowledgeable you know, I want to connect with him and, and see if he'll coach me. So, and luckily you had openings and, you know, we were able to connect. So. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's been a great sharing this journey with you because you've done some, some awesome events since we've been together, um, including the bear and, and hellbender, um, you know, and, and just seeing you go through these things. Um, what made you connect with Coca Dona? Uh, well, Cocodona, I've been following this race ever since it was announced. Um, and it's just this crazy thought that I've always had. And I've been following the race ever since 2021 when it was first, excuse me, introduced. But um, it just looked like an adventure. Mm -hmm. Um uh, it was something beyond what I had ever done, something beyond just a race, but an actual 
uh, experience and adventure. It wasn't sure. just a, a 24 hour to 40 hour thing. This was a whole week thing that could, you'd be sleeping, you'd be going through several different environments, seeing a whole different parts of a state. Just, it was, um, it seemed like a, just a magical experience to me um, that I wanted to experience. Um, although 250 seemed kind of crazy to me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I had talked about it so much. I had followed it on the, um, on the, on YouTube and, uh, and actually I didn't actually sign up for the race myself. Um, my wife signed me up for the race. Uh, she bought it for me as a father's day gift. Uh, last year she surprised me. We were up in Acadia national park, uh, hiking, and uh, on Father's Day, she handed me a card and you know, said, you know, I've signed you up for Coco Dona 2024. And I got a little emotional about it. Yes. Um, and um, I said, well, it's happening. You know, I, mean, I guess I must have talked about it way too much to her. <laughs> and she was like, I don't want to hear him talk anymore. Just do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's and that I had talked with Ben about this because you know Ben had his conversation. Well, he didn't get to have the conversation. He his uh, his girlfriend now they weren't dating at the time he signed up. So you know usually it's a conversation that we have to present to our significant other at a time where they're in a good mood. Um, but in this case, your wife was like, "Here, hey, you're you're doing this. Good luck." <laughs> yeah, she was, and she was like, you know, I've. Are you taking the time off? I'm crewing you for the race. So um, oh, she always crews me for all my races. So she, yeah. she knows what to do. That's awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> That's, you know, like, because oftentimes we, you know, we, we have to talk about what that conversation was like, but this was like almost like a role reversal, which is cool. Yep. Yeah. That's, yep, that's yep. so cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, you have two kids? I have two kids, Tanner. He's uh, 14 and Natalie, she's nine. Okay. So. But what do they think about all this craziness? Well, I, I think they're super supportive. Um, they think I'm crazy. Actually, they're not, they don't, <laughs> I get super stoked when I'm about to go out and do these things. They're like, I, they don't, I don't know why you're so excited about this, but they, they're very supportive uh, on the local races like Hellbender. They were there for crewing and stuff. Um, and, um, my son actually paced me in Black Canyon this past nice. uh, the hundred k this uh, past February, but he's he's become a runner, um, and I don't push him to do running. I just you know he actually went into it on his own. Um, he's in track and cross country, and uh, he's doing well. He actually um, at fourteen he's already done a, a marathon. He's already done a fifty k. Wow. So he's sort of following in my in my footsteps. I'm like, you don't have to do these things. He's like. <laughs> He's like, no, I want to do this. He, he says his his goal for the his next goal is to do the Leadville Marathon. I'm like, that's probably the hardest marathon in the country. But oh, man, taking <laughs> yeah. right after you. That's for, that's for sure. Wow, he's taking a page right out of Mike's book. That's pretty yeah. impressive, dude. That's pretty cool. Um, man, well, that's cool that the kids are are there. Um, you um, you had sent me a picture of the the letter that they wrote to you um yeah can you are you okay talking about that yeah um my uh my daughter natalie she before rim to river last year she uh she just all the time will do these great little things she'll just give little gifts or um, little supportive things like in the morning she'll write you a note saying i love you and you know because you know life is hard you know, it's, but, um, you know, she, she gives us little things as, you know, support. And, um, and she wrote me a little note. It says, um, I believe you can finish this. I believe you never give up and I believe in you. No. Um, and then she signed her name at the bottom of it. <laughs> um, so I carried that with me during that race and I went home and laminated it. Uh, I've been carrying it with me, uh, ever since, you know, so I had it all during Cocodona. I, I brought it out going down Mount Eldon and carried it across the finish line. So yeah, you, you said that dry eyed. I, I'm, I'm already tearing up, but <laughs> Woo, man, that's powerful. Oh, that's beautiful, man. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was taking it out. I mean, there was a lot of um, low moments that I would bring it out and, 
just look at it and, um, you know, I, I maybe I'm not myself strong enough to do things, but if I have others that love me and want me to do good and they know that I can do good, um, or persevere or just keep going, then that, that gives me some extra strength to go, you know? And I think yeah. you and I both know as, as dads that love our kids, that, that, yeah. that can really light a fire under your butt, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh yeah, man. Oof. Um, you know, Mike's, Mike's got, um, when he's working, he's busy. Like, you know, it's, I, I see his training peaks and, he'll put notes in and he'll like out of work this weekend. You know, I probably can only do like two hours each day, but you know, Mike's got a, a different level of perseverance and grit that, you know, even if we can't put in the volume, but we, you know, we talked about Ben cause I, I increased Ben's volume because he was more concerned about being able to, to cover that distance. It was, you know, he's, he has less experience than you. Um, but Mike, I don't worry so much about getting in total volume. I just worry about consistency and I you know Mike, he vacations hard, <laughs> um, you know, but he goes out hiking all of a sudden he'll upload a, you know, we went hiking for nine hours today. So I know Mike's getting time on his feet, you know? Um, so his training and, and Ben and I talked about this is completely different. You know, uh, like when in our conversation, I said, if I held up the two of your training for Coca Dona, they were completely different. There was probably a, there wasn't a day that was probably the same, um, because you're two very different people and coming with very different experiences. Um, what gives you confidence in training? What makes you feel confident? Um, if you pull, draw something from training, what would you say that is? Um, well, like you said, consistency, um, and I, I do put a, I put a lot of faith in, in you and your training plan. Um, and, um, I know you have what my best interest in mind. So if, if I can, at least my goal is to do at least 90% of what you say, um, if I can do that and be consistent with it, I'm, I'm happy um and i do i have also of i know i've done tough things i mean I, yeah. the some of the races i've done have really destroyed me i mean um one particular the one i always go back to is grindstone mm. i was just destroyed during that race and um i mean i i wanted to give up so many times but you know persevered and just gutted it out got a slow time but i still was able to get it out and, and finish it. It was, it was just a tough, tough race for me. So I always go back to that. And of course, I mean, if I can, you know, finish things like ben, the Hellbender and, and, and the bear, that gives me a lot of, of confidence um, going into um, these hard races. So, yeah. um, and, and you know, just a, a lot of that. So, I mean, like yeah. I said, your, your training plan and, and what I've done before. So. Yeah. Right on. And it was, you know, we had a conversation uh, prior to race day, um, you know, and, and um, I, yeah, I just found it interesting that you were, you said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go pacerless. It's, you know, it's a long time to be out there. <laughs> so um, I know that a lot of times you go pacerless and that's, you know, is that something you're more comfortable with? Um, You know, I'm just as, for for one thing, I'm an extreme introvert. <laughs> <laughs> As you talk uh, about this, <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, I mean, I guess I, I just don't feel super comfortable reaching out to folks and asking for pacers. Um, a lot of my friends don't even know what ultra running is. I don't really talk mm. to them about it. Um, so, um, but. You know, actually, I mean, my first pacer I ever had was my son at Black Canyon 100K. Mm -hmm. um, all their all my other races, I've never had pacers. And actually, this race I did happen to, to have to get some pacers at the end fortuitously. Um, um, actually, I met up with the. Uh, there's another podcast I listen to called Happy uh, Happy Endings Trail Podcast. Uh, they come out of Texas. Okay. Um, uh, Andrew Marvin is on that one. Um, so I knew him, um, and I sort of just said hi to him at the, uh, the check-in and he was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know your name and stuff. Well, later in the race, uh, his runner that he was true and unfortunately had to 
pull out of the race because he's having some knee issues, potential knee injury, uh, but he still wanted to pace. And so he paced me at the end of the race when John, oh, cool. I was actually super, super tired. <laughs> so it was actually, a, I really didn't need a pacer at that time. And it was a great experience for me. And then um, I had another, one of his friends, uh, uh, Kathleen Hanley, um, also from Texas. Um, she wanted to just pace me from, um, Walnut Canyon to the finish, which is another 20 mile stretch. So I mean, it worked out pretty good. So I did have two pacers at the end. They were great, fantastic. And this is one of the one things that I really love about ultra running. It's just, um, meeting people, the community, um, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but if, if, if we could, if this could be like a, how real life is, you know, it's, uh, yeah. all these people come together all walks of life doesn't matter you know yeah. who you are where you came from your size you know your you gender religion yeah. race doesn't mean anything it's just we all want to be there we all want to help each other um everybody wants you to finish you know it's not about beating the other person it's just about sort of helping people out and uh i really do express a lot of great uh, gratitude to andrew and kathleen for helping me out there at the end yeah that's cool yeah, that's cool um, and now, you know, you also were talking to me about in this pre-race, like your wife, you're like, ah, oh, she'll meet me at, you know, a few different aid stations. <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously you don't want to put too much on her, but you know, you also had to make sure that you had what you needed. Cause there was going to be some big stretches out there. I, you know, we you know, I talked with Ben about how much that first 50 K was going to require of you. Um, how did that go for you? Because, you know, like Ben was carrying six liters of water and I think you were somewhere around the, around the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think any, if you don't know about Coco Don, it is, um, a lot of people will say that it, it's a 250 mile race, but the first 50 K may be the hardest 50 K in the country. And he might even be the first 100 K is the hardest 100 K in the country. And, and we've talked about the races I've done before. That first 50K was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it, it was just, it took it out of me. Um, what makes it so, just so people kind of get a picture? Um, well, it, it runs through the, the Bradshaw Mountains. Um, you're going from um, the Black Canyon City. Um, up, um, the first 30 miles or so. Um and uh it's just going the i have this the vert here somewhere um it's about ten thousand feet of vert over 25 miles <laughs> um and it's a lot of loose rock um very steep climbs it's exposed um it wasn't super hot this year thankfully but it was still in the 80s at least you know 80s okay. to uh, low 90s or so um and i had thought i was prepared for that section as best as i could we did even heat training we did sauna work yeah. um um and it just took it out of me i i did carry six liters of water um I had all the extra nutrition on me so i did have a lot of weight on my back yeah um and I got to around mile 28 or so of that section right before the end of the section. And I had already sat down a couple of times. Um, and the, there's a little bit of shade here and there just by trees, not much, but you'll, you'll sit down in the shade and take a break. And I took a break and I just, I opened up my phones to, to check if I had service. And I said, if I do, I'm going to call my wife and just tell her, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually did have service. I called her at mile 28 and I said, I just don't know if I can do this. It's really, really hard. And, and I was breathing hard. I was so getting lightheaded. Um, and I was almost at the end, but I just, and then I started thinking about all the rest of the stuff I had to do throughout this race. And I was like, I don't know if this is possible. And she was on the other end of the line. Um, she was like, you know what? You're almost to the first aid station, Lane Mountain, um, or the next aid station. But uh, just walk it, do the best you can, try to get there, try to regroup and see if you can get it done. And so I did. 
Um, and I eventually made it and it was fine. But at the moment, I really didn't know if I was going to make it. It is just extremely, extremely hard. Um, and uh, so, and then actually, I did not see her for the first 78 miles of the race um, because the, uh, the first, uh, the first aid station that she can come to is a little bit difficult of a drive to come to. And I didn't really want her driving all the way up there. She could have popped a tire or something. So I just told her, go to Whiskey Row in Prescott and I'll meet you there at mile 78. So I didn't even see her for a whole day. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy good. Um, but you were able to use drop bags? I had, uh, yeah, I used, actually, I, I used two drop bags because I knew I would have her. So during that first 78 mile section, um, I had a drop bag, uh, two drop bags. And one was uh, after that first uh, 50K where I would switch bags because the first bag I had, I was using the uh, Ultra Spire Epic XT. And that's okay. sort of like a, that's just a backpack. Right, like basically. A backpacking it's not pack. A, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I just wanted to switch out of that. So I switched out of that to the Zygos, um, mm -hmm. um, which is what I use for the rest of the race. And okay. um and then I had a little bit, a little drop bag at the, a couple of aid stations down where I just had some nutrition, but that's the only time I'd use drop bags. Gotcha. Um, and yeah. my, my, my nutrition changed throughout the race. Actually, it was not even to plan. I was just. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, rightly so in a 250 mile race, but touch on that. Like, how did it change? Um, so initially, you know, I had a ton of water, um, and uh, I was using um, spring energy gels. I was using precision hydration gels. Um, and I was using Tailwind as uh, my drink mix. Um, so I was, and I had some salt tabs I was using. So I would try to take a, um, at least one energy gel per hour, um, drink my Tailwind, take a salt tab. And that was in the first section. Um, and that all went good and I had no problems actually with nutrition. Um, never felt bad GI wise, but what I discovered was these aid stations at two hundreds have a lot of great food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just started eating heavily at these aid stations um, and they would have real food like hamburgers, pizza, tacos, uh, lasagna, spaghetti, just everything. So mm -hmm. I would try to eat a whole meal at each of these aid stations. And then I wouldn't have, I didn't have to not take as much gel throughout after that first uh, initial 50 K. So I just started eating a lot of real food. Um, we still have the tailwind and, um, and go from there, but I didn't really need that as many gels as I thought I would throughout the race, just because of all the solid food I was eating. Let me ask you something too. And I, I asked Ben this and I'm just curious, how did you carry six liters of water? Um, well, I had uh, the Epic XT. Um, I put a three liter bladder okay. as my initial bladder. I was using, I had two 500 milliliter flasks okay. and then I, and then I put a whole separate two liter bladder set up with an extra hose in the pack. Um, so when I ran out of the three liter, I would just switch to the two liter. Um, and actually I did not even require the full six liters for that first 50 K, um, because it wasn't as hot as normal. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was probably a good thing because I don't know if Ben told you, but, uh, the there was two happened. water drops. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the water drops, uh, half the water got stolen apparently. So they only could give us a half a liter of, of yeah, fluid. Say that. Um, but so, I mean, some people, I think were affected by that, but I had more than enough water. I actually had probably too much water uh, for that day. I mean, maybe it would have been fine if it was super hot, but um, I think I had, I, had, oh, I had too much, which was probably good, I guess. But. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So uh, anything, anything crazy besides the stolen water <laughs> transpired before you got to, to your wife there at Whiskey Row? Um. Well, that whole section, so, so after, um, let me just bring up the uh, first, 
Okay, so Crown King is that first major aid station. It's like just a little town in the middle of the uh, mountains, basically. Yeah. Um, so after Crown King, you uh, will run another 16 miles to Arasta Creek, and that's basically a, a long 16 mile downhill section. Okay. After that, though, is another big climb that some people um, sort of overlook. It's um, the the climb to climb. Camp Kippa, it's and it's on this little trail called the Yankee Doodle Trail, and it is a bear. Um, that was a super, that was a big surprise, I think, for a lot of folks. Uh, I had done a lot of research on this race, so I knew about it a little bit, um, but it was just very rugged. It was sort of like the first um, 50K all over again, but it sort of condensed into a, about a six-mile section, but oh. a pretty rugged, mm -hmm. uphill, loose <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that was another surprise going from um before i before i met my wife but um you know it was amazing to me that uh you know what you can i thought you know i've done 100 milers in um you know 30 hours or so but um to get to my wife and at 78 miles it took just about that much to <laughs> yeah 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 any any sleep during that time um actually i didn't sleep maybe i slept for like 20 minutes at a at a aid station like just by a fire during that first 78 mm -hmm. uh, miles but my sleep really started after i saw her because we had her all set up in a uh she had a ford expeditions and we had a, a bed set up in the back this thermo rest bed which is super comfortable we so we it was it was great mm -hmm. um so i did a lot of sleeping back there right on and um did you so you took a did you take a big sleep when you got to her at um so at, at whiskey row um i took about a two hour nap okay and uh that was pretty standard for me whenever i wanted to take a nap um um i actually i slept a lot i guess for what people normally sleep in 200s i mean i slept about 10 and a half hours during this race wow. yeah. um um, mostly I would sleep about two hours. It was one time I slept for about three and a half hours, but, but it, it turned out, it turned out great. So I, I think yeah, that, that was, it was an amazing, uh, I think it was a great thing for me to get, get that much sleep. It was like a whole new, I felt like a whole new person after yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, I, they say you need about 90 minutes. So, I mean, you got two hours, which is great. And, um, you know, Ben was, he said five to six hours total. Um, but he was also, you know, um, he was a bit behind you and you were still getting enough sleep, like two hours. And here he is getting 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so two very different races, you know, and, and just based on what your strategy was and timing. Um, ben used Ultra Pacer to kind of get a, a timeline. Did you do that, too? I used Ultra Pacer, yeah. Um, like I had an A, a B, and a C goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, A goal was like a hundred hours, which I didn't think I was going to get, but it was there. Mm -hmm. The B goal was 110 hours, and the C goal was 120 hours. So I was right in between B and C in the mm -hmm. end, um, and that was pretty good actually. I I used that primarily to let my wife know where I would be at certain points, so she sure. would know um, because I had before I, before the race I had went and I had booked several hotels along the route mm -hmm. for her to stay in or at least shower in so she mm -hmm. would know like okay i can go here check in maybe take a nap take a shower or something i can get back to where he'll be based on this predicted time so it's a pretty cool tool yeah absolutely and how was the live tracking ben and i kind of talked about it because um in the results like when i was tracking you guys uh, you could see, you know, it would pop up as you hit aid stations. It would, you know, just kind of go and say, uh, you know, he reached this aid station this time. Ben's last checkpoint was around 153 or something like that. And then it didn't have anything. And then all of a sudden it said finished. You know, that's, that's a big okay. span. There's like 100 miles that are missing, but it just had finished. So that's why I didn't, I wasn't sure. Like, did he finish? Yeah. You know, because all that was missing. Um, did your wife use the live tracking at all? And if so, how did that work out? Um, yeah, and it worked out great. Now there was two different types of two different live tracking links. Um, one that showed the map mm -hmm. and you could click on the person yeah. and see like their mile per hour speed and right. predicted time to next yep. aid station. It worked great. She yep. was able to like, she would be at an aid station and she would wait 
um, at the check-in point for me based on where I was on that tracker. So you would just pull it up and say, okay, he's about, you know, half a mile away. He'll be here in a little bit. So yeah. um, it worked great for us. Did she have pretty good reception throughout the course to be able to do such? Oh yeah. And, and, and Cocodona is an, an amazing course for crew. It's easily, except for that um, one first aid station. Um, I think the rest of it is super easy access um, and there's cell service along the whole route. So it's a great course for crew, very easy ex access. And so, I mean, and she loved that. So That's it was not like Bigfoot or anything. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about that at all um, <laughs> uh, well that that's cool um i did yeah i pulled up you know you had sent me the link prior to the race and so i was you know i'd pop on there and see where you guys were and, and kind of send you guys a text and at, you know it, it was um it was kind of after that uh right after 100 miles i said hey man you know keep moving you're doing great and uh you texted back we're doing something special here um talk about that what what were you feeling in that moment um i think that was right after i came out of jerome um heading down into the verde valley um and that was a special time for me i i wasn't expecting you know all this beauty around me in the verde valley um but it was like this, this overwhelming thought um you know, after a hundred miles, that was a PR for me. Each step was a PR for me after that. I had never done that before. Um, and here I was, I, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to finish this race. Um, and even just in, you know, at mile 28, I didn't, wasn't sure if I was going to be able to finish this race. Um, and here I was now over a hundred miles, each step is a PR, I mean, you know, just going through this amazing, amazing course, beauty all around me. Uh, I think I was just overwhelmed. Um, I how grateful I was to be out there. Um, grateful for you as a coach, grateful to my wife for being there for me for this experience and, you know, grateful to all my friends, um, and family that were supporting me along the way. It was, mm -hmm. And it's just, a, you know, those things just hit you every once in a while. And it just sure. makes it such a special experience. So. Uh, the one thing that we talked about was staying present, you know, staying in that mile you were in. How were you able to do so? Were you able to stay, you know, in that mile? Did you start thinking about, oh, man, I got this much to go? Or were you able to say, no, I'm right here and I'm enjoying this moment? I actually, this race... Um, I didn't think of it as a race and it's, it's not a race for me. I'm not a front runner. Um, I thought about it as a journey. Um, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to enjoy every moment. Um, so whenever I, there was a lot of low patches, a lot of low patches, it, it was, this race is hard. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also knew I would try to go back to, I want to enjoy this race. I want to enjoy the environment around me, the surroundings, the people. Um, that kept me present in the moment. Um, it helped me to keep going. I wouldn't, in a race this big, you really can't think about, oh, I have 150 miles to go or I have 125 miles to go. Um, that's just too much. Um, so I would stay present in the moment. I would think aid station to aid station, and I would enjoy that section of the course because the course is so different. Um, just, I can't even begin to explain it. It's just, you see so many things along this race course um, that if you don't enjoy the journey, you're going to miss out on it. So I, I, I was present during the race, and it made it a super... An incredible experience for me that's awesome um ben was um if I, if i were to say one thing that ben repeated over and over again was his feet um how did your feet do oh they were terrible <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, I think that that is the you know uh the one thing in these 200s that i've heard and i've learned um is that your feet really really hurt um 
and that's true. They, they, they definitely hurt a lot. My legs didn't hurt a lot. Um, I didn't have gut issues, but the feet really hurt. Um, I had a lot, a dev I had several blisters and we were very diligent about foot care. Actually, to, to my, I was telling my wife, I mean, she would, she would give me the greatest foot massages um, when I would come in and there is nothing like a foot massage after a hundred miles on yeah. my feet. It's just, it's just an undescribable experience. And I said, you know what? Uh, this is amazing. I, I only do this for the foot massages after a mile. Yeah. On. <laughs> so I was like, we're, we're coming back next year. We're, we're going to get you a, we're going to get you a, to give me some more foot massages. Uh, Spoiler alert. I did. I did sign up for next year already. <laughs> Oh my God. That's too funny. Oh, so, um, yeah, you guys are crazy, but I love you. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, when you say you were diligent about foot care, um, what type of things were you doing? What were you using to try to aid the foot from, you know, uh, well, I had never pre, I had not pre taped my feet before, so I did not want to do that just as an experiment starting mm -hmm. in this race. Um, sure. Uh, so all I did initially is I had the Njinji toe socks, which I had been using. I have uh, um, the Squirrel's Nut Butter foot um, foot rub or foot foot mm -hmm. salve that they yep. use, um, and I would use that. I would actually clean my feet every um, aid station if I could. Initially, I was by myself for that seventy eight miles, so I would have foot wipes or and just wipe my feet clean, put on some new squirrels nut butter, put on new socks uh, and go. And then my wife would then take over after mile 78 and she would uh, do the same thing. But then when I started developing blisters, we had um, some hypodermic needles. Uh, we would, you know, pre-package, we would use, you know, once one use thing. So we would, uh, um, we pop the blisters, we would tape them uh, once they came up and, um, so that seemed to work good. And actually the, the funny thing is, is that, um, and I think you know this too, is that foot pain, it's there, but after about 10 miles or so, it really just sort of seems to no. go away. Even, <laughs> yeah. even blister pain, even blister pain, it's just yep. like, you know, it's there. And I'm like, you know what? It's there. I can't do anything about it. I'm keep, I'm just going to go, mm -hmm. you know, so just go and, and, and grit it out. So <laughs> it's going to go away eventually. I mean, that's, that's the thing on these, these 200 milers is that you start to heal over the course of the race. So like the, the, that first 50 K, which was terrible and tore me up. I probably was healing from, um, you know, over the next couple of days and it wasn't, you know, it's just, you start to heal and repair yourself as you go along. So nice. Did you get to talk to your kids at all over the, the course of the race? Yeah. Uh, I, I talked to them before I would take naps. Um, it's also wasn't like uh, two or three in the morning or something like right. that. But, uh, um, and, and actually my wife had done this thing for me. Um, before we left, she, re she pre-recorded um, messages for each aid station, oh. uh, depending on the mile I was at. So, you know, they would say, you know, dad, you're at mile 110 you know you've never been this far before <laughs> keep going you're doing great or like a mile 200 oh my goodness uh you know so that was that was awesome so i got these little messages each time i was about to start up again uh after my naps or after you know going <laughs> leaving an aid station so it was great that's awesome that's awesome um so um your wife has crewed for you you said previously um do you guys have a pretty set routine like when you come in x y and z is done and like or was it different every time how do you guys operate um well, well she's you know it, this was completely different actually um you know normally the aid stations she'll have to wheel uh, a cart down to where the aid station is at these hundred milers because not all of them you can just park at sure uh this one this one you the A stations, all you just park and you work out of the back of your vehicle, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, you didn't have to uh, go to anywhere for aid. Um, and we were set up 
I try to be as organized as possible. I had a bunch of like shoe boxes, like clear plastic shoe box bins. Mm -hmm. We would label them, you know, gels, foot care, uh, medicine, you know, lights, batteries, whatever. Um, and she would know basically what I needed. I mean, water refills, I need uh, nutrition and foot care when I came in. Um, and uh, she would, depending on, because it, 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 during this race, you know, it's super cold at night and it's hot during the day. So was I going into a cold section? I would have to pack my uh, gloves, have to pack my, my puffy jacket. Um, or was I going into a hot section? We'd have to play, apply some sunscreen or something like that. So it became pretty routine uh, during this race, but it's, it was a whole new experience for us. And she learned very fast and um, she was amazing. Uh, so I can't thank her enough for uh, everything she did. And uh, super, I mean, I hope she's at all of these things because I don't know if I could do it without her. <laughs> so, so, and so these these containers, you bought them while you were out there? No, I've, I've just bought them on Amazon. They're like, you know, little uh, shoebox containers. Oh, um, you, you flew them out? Yeah, yeah. I just, okay. yeah. I mean, we you should have seen us walking through the, uh, the Charlotte airport. We had like four huge bags and, uh, you know, we well, four to five huge bags. And people are like, where are you going? And I was like, oh, well, um, we're running a race out in Arizona. Like, how long? Oh, how long is that? <laughs> Two and <a> miles. Oh, <laughs> Are you biking that? No, we're not, no. We're not biking it, but <laughs> Are you gonna drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's always the question, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, and how how was that traveling with all that stuff? Because that can be logistically challenging. I remember, you know, Bigfoot having all that crap, and I was just like, you know, trying to check in yeah. on bags. It, it gets a little expensive, obviously, but how was yeah. it traveling yeah. for you? Uh, pretty smooth sailing for us. Um, I had taken your advice and splitting up the batteries into different, like she had a book bag, I had a book bag. So we split the batteries up Good. and thankfully none of our bags got lost. I had those little oh. Apple trackers in the bag so I could nice. see if they made it or not. And we had a one-way flight, so it was, uh, you know, no stops or anything, but it, right. it was the only dif the difficult part was just getting the luggage from the car and to check in and stuff. So yeah. that was about yeah. it. Yeah, right. Well, and for those that don't know, um, when I went to Western States last year, I had um, a bag of batteries and um, security said that I had too many lithium batteries and you're supposed to carry on your lithiums. Uh, they're not supposed to be checked. So um, they confiscated my batteries and told me that I would be able to retrieve those, um, you know, later on. And, and it, I never was able to retrieve them. So um that's why mike was saying he split up his batteries between him and his wife's bag which is probably a smart thing if you're doing a 200 miler and, and need you know like a good stash of batteries um break them up because security can be you never know you don't know you know and that's the problem is you, you never know what security is going to do and what they're going to say you can take and you can't take so um yeah definitely um so um moving on uh you've, you've had some some uh you know some really um amazing uh, pictures and stuff that you, you took and um man it's it's it sounds like an amazing course which is totally awesome um getting later into the race um kind of describe when you know when you're in those upper miles um how was like your mindset and how was your uh, you know ben talked about how he was he he actually <laughs> he felt like his crew was actually going to kill him <laughs> he was getting kind of delusional. So where, where were you? Were you uh, hallucinating? How were you doing? Um, I was pretty clear for the most part there. I mean, there were a few times where I would fall asleep walking. Um, and I would start to see lights out in the fields and they weren't on a trail or anything, but so that was probably, and then like, you know, some of the, the rocks that are black on the ground, I thought they were something else, maybe animals or something. And you always see like the, if you're in a burnt area and you see the tree stump that is burned, you're like, is that a bear or is that mm -hmm. a cow or something? Mm -hmm. But that's about it. Nothing too serious in terms of hallucinations. But um, I think the, the funniest part for me was when Andrew was uh, uh, pacing me, um, I, you know, I would basically be 
have one eye closed and then I would close the other eye, open up the other eye. I was so used to doing that. It's <laughs> like, maybe I can do that to, to sleep a little bit. Half sleep. Well, I'm surprised that I didn't just fall down and, and bust my face on that, that section of the trail. That was, you know, that was pretty close to the end of the race, but uh Yeah, that, that was, I've never had that amount of exhaustion when I was running before. <laughs> no amount of caffeine at that point yeah, that can help the, you. It's, yeah. yeah, at the end of that, that was right before Fort Todd Hill. And I was like, Andrew, what I want to do here is I just want to sprint to the aid station. That might be the only way I can stay awake. <laughs> so we just, we just sprinted a half mile to the aid station and I immediately just ate, like I ate some spaghetti and meatballs and went straight to sleep. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. Oh my God. Um, right on. So, and then you had, um, forgive me. Um, the, there was the female that paced you the last 20. Yeah, Kathleen Hanley. Kathleen, um, yes. Yeah, she uh she um she was great actually. She's she's an experienced 200 miler. She's done the divide and um I think she's done Moab before too. Um she actually who was her husband uh, Jason that um was doing the race and he had the knee issues or he yeah. had to pull out because of potential injury but you know they were good enough that they 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 approached my wife. They were like, hey, you know, can we pace Mike, you know? Um, so that's just amazing. Um, and yeah, she paced me uh, for the last 22 miles, which was um, going, you know, through Flagstaff, up Mount Eldon and down Mount Eldon. Um, cool thing was at the base of Mount Eldon, I heard this uh, this guy come down and I was like, you know, I really recognize that. But I said, I know that voice. It was AJW. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I knew I knew that. I knew I knew that voice. So I like got a picture with him and stuff. I was like, this is awesome. Um and so and then at the top of Eldon, I don't know if you've heard before, but there's a um the aid station up there is run by Peter Mortimer. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's called Pete's Meats. He has just tons of really good meat. Um <laughs> that they barbecue all night there. I had some wow. chicken, I had ribs, I had <laughs> mac and cheese up there. Um <laughs> And I was like, I was like right in front of a space heater and Kathleen looked at me. She's like, are you falling asleep? And I was like, no, no, I'm fine. We're good. <laughs> um, so <laughs> oh, ribs will knock you right out, man. What are you doing? eating ribs? <laughs> it was good. It was so good. Uh, I mean, they, they had so much different meats up there. It was good. That's crazy. That's awesome though. That's cool. That's cool. So, um, she brings you into the finish, um, you know, Ben talked about how emotional he was. What was it for you? Um, it was like a sort of real experience. I mean, this, so my plan to, so it's like a, basically an eight miles downhill mm -hmm. to the finish after mm -hmm. Mount Eldon. Um, and I really wanted to run that because I usually run at the end of my races, um, like at the end of the bear, like it's all downhill. I ran that whole thing pretty fast. Um, but I developed like severe quad pain um, on my, my right quad. And I was only able to walk no. <laughs> the whole eight, the whole last eight miles. So I kept apologizing to Kathleen and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going super slow, but I cannot do anything on this. It was all downhill hurting my, my quad. And she was like, no, you're doing super strong. You're doing great. Um, so it was like a surreal experience to me. Um, and uh, you know, we came into Flagstaff and um, trimmed the corner and there was a the finish line and I was sort of out of it a little bit. I just sort of did a slow jog to the finish and my wife was there. Actually, Andrew was there. Jason was there. Um, and uh, it was, I was sort of out of my, out of my mind, actually. I didn't really, I don't even know what to think about it, but. <laughs> what, what time of day did you finish? Uh, just after midnight, I think. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact time. I finished around 115 hours or so, uh, just a little bit after 115 hours. That's right. um, so not not fast, but it I, was. That was my goal, man. Finish. Yeah, yeah. Finish that was my finish. goal. I I I did the thing, and uh, I was able to see this full course, which I can't even put into words how special it is. Um, 
they Aravipa um really puts on a great great race um and you know there's a reason why this race is already sold out for next year um it's it's this is so uh special so, such a great variety um it's such a big test for yourself um and i was out to dinner with my wife on saturday after the race and uh it was sort of just hitting me you know i was taking it all in i'd already done my sleep after the the race finish and i started getting a little bit emotional just sitting there at the dinner table she's like what's wrong and i was like that was really hard i mean that was that was really really hard um but it was totally worth it um and i am super glad that i just i'm su super glad for one thing she signed me up and super glad i was um you know put the faith and 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 training in and and you know was able to just believe in myself um and have others believe in me um that I was able to do this thing it was it was something else man yeah. it was something else that's cool was your wife okay with you signing up again <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, well i <laughs> i mean i i i think she knew, well during the race i had told her there's no way I want to do this again. This is way too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but we all know you cannot uh, really hold anybody accountable for what they say during a race. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, during the race, I was like, there's no way. This is a one done. This thing is way too hard. Yeah. I am not doing this ever again. Um, but right after the race, like within hours, I was just like, I want to come back. I want to do this again. And I had always thought, like, you know, this race potentially could be like a yearly thing for me. I don't know. But at least, you know, I'm signed up for it next year. I hope I'm healthy enough to do it and trained enough to do it. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm already looking forward to it. So. Okay. So after seeing this course and, you know, going back next year, what are some things that you would like to see in your training? Um, maybe things that we could do differently or better? Um, you know, I don't think it's like, a, well, I'm not going to be shooting for like, I'm not shooting to go for a very fast time. Sure. Um, I, again, I just want to finish it on. Well, things that can make you more comfortable, right? Like what, what are some things and, and you don't have to answer it now, but it's something to think on. If there's something that you're like, you know, it, it would have behooved me to, uh, to do, you know, more climbing so that I was a little bit more comfortable in that 50 K. Um, but just yeah. some things that's, you know, that's just, I always want to make sure. Go ahead. I think that, um, so spending some more time with a heavy pack mm. because you got to have a lot mm. of fluids for that first section. That was on me. I should have done that a little bit more. Um, and uh, one thing I thought about, which might be a cool workout for these uh, 200 milers, because basically we're power hiking yes. a majority of it. Right. Um, so I don't know if like do a long run, do like a 15 to 20 mile long run, and then mm -hmm. just do a power hike for the same amount of distance, mm -hmm. like do a 30 mile day, 15 mile, 15 miles. I don't know if that would be beneficial. That's basically what I was well, doing. I was, yeah, yeah. I would do like an, I call it the ultra shuffle, yeah. which was like a little tiny run, which was like a 13 to 16 minute pace. Mm -hmm. um, but my power hike was anywhere from 15 to uh, 20 minute pace. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just the combination of those things together, probably that's what I'm doing the whole entire race. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what Ben and I had talked about. But, you know, Ben, his schedule was a little bit more free so like friday we would do kind of like a medium long run saturday we would do like a really long hike and then sunday we would do his longest run um mm -hmm. or if it was super long run and he was able to we'd put that on friday so we'd have the biggest bulk of his you know fatigue on friday and then you know the other days would be a little bit less but it's all depending on your schedule and you know i, I we talked as well as in ben's episode that 
hiking is such a big part of this, you know, and, and with your yeah. time availability, we, we certainly tried to get as much aerobic capacity as we could. And that's why we had to do mm-hmm. more runs, but you can't underestimate the value of hiking for an event like this. So, it, you know, the more that we can add, obviously the better. So I, I, I'm certainly, if there's time in your schedule, I am never opposed to adding more hiking. So, um, now there's yeah. a, there's a lot of runnable section in this course. Mm-hmm. There's a lot, a lot. Um, if you have the legs for it, you can really make up a lot of time on it. So, um, you know, some of those I did run, some of them I just hiked. Yeah. But right on, right on, man. Well, congratulations on the, the finish, Mike. It's super awesome. Um, you have the divide, the divide, yes, divide 200. 200. Yeah. That's coming up in, uh, we said September. Um, can you tell the folks a little bit about the divide 200? For those that aren't familiar, what's that one about? where is it yeah it's in uh it's in western canada on uh, i think near alberta canada mm-hmm. um and this is another big boy race <laughs> 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 um so uh if you haven't heard the divide look it up on youtube as a really epic uh video um and that's probably one of the reasons I signed up for it because I was, I'm one of those victims for a really good race video. Um, <laughs> but to actually, you know, uh, I learned about it too from the, the happy endings uh, podcast. And so, um, and it's you know, 200 miles uh, through Alpine wilderness. Um, I think a lot of it is, you know, a lot of trail, there's a lot of Jeep roads, Again, this is another one where the first 50K is going to be like the, the hardest 50K that you've ever done mm. <laughs> type of thing. Exactly. Uh, one thing I'm kind of nervous about is um, I, have to, I know there's some uh, shale descents. Like we have mm. to learn to run on scree. that kind of scree fields. Yes, yes, scree mm. fields. Yeah. Um, I have to learn to, to side of I know have, some descents how to slide. Yeah, you have to learn how to slide. Yeah, how to <laughs> how to slide. Um, <laughs> it's you know, it's an alpine, it's an alpine race. Mm-hmm. Um and um I've heard it's I heard it's an easy crewable race. It's good for crew, so my wife cool. is happy about that. Um but uh, you know, there's you know it's 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 in the wilderness. So yeah. um yeah. and um but all the things that come with the wilderness are gonna be there. <laughs> um yep. so yes. um i'm nervous and i'm also excited about that but cool. uh very and cool. uh, so looking forward to it absolutely as i am it's awesome buddy i am so happy for you that's incredible um you keep wearing that hat um <laughs> you keep crushing all these awesome events man um if people want to connect with you is there a way they can find you on socials yeah, I'm on. Uh, I mean, I'm on Instagram. I don't do much on it. Um, I think it's like get uh, underscore some underscore trail. Um, I'm also on Facebook. You can send me a friend request or something, um, Mike Reardon. But uh, you know, I'm you know, I'm Opposite always looking to connect. Shows. Yeah, yeah, I'm always looking to connect with people. I love this community. I I love everything about it. It's it it makes me so happy. I mean, life is tough, but. Uh, this makes it, you know, and, and you know, this is, it makes it a lot easier day to day when I can think about these types of things and, um, and do these types of great things uh, with my life. So yeah, I'm very absolutely. happy. Uh, you're incredible, man. I love watching and following along and seeing all your, your epic journeys. So thanks for letting me be a part of that. I appreciate you, buddy. Oh, th- thank you, dude. I, I mean, I mean, I, I'm very grateful for everything you've done for me and, and uh, the time you put in to um, the thought, the time and thought you put into my training. And um, I know I'm I'm introverted and stuff, but I, I pay attention to everything <laughs> you say and I take everything super seriously. Um, I know my schedule sucks and I'm very busy with other stuff, but I mean, I'm very, I'm very much appreciative of everything you've ever done for me. So I th- no. thanks, man. He says he's introverted, but we have good phone conversations, so don't let him fool you too much. I mean, he leaves good comments on Training Peaks. So, <laughs> thanks again, Mike. Congrats to both Ben Gons and Mike Reardon on uh, their respective finishes at Coca Dona 250. I couldn't be prouder as a coach, as a friend. Uh, they just did incredible. It was uh, so great to hear their journeys too. 
I loved hearing all about the the experiences they had and how transformative it was. So, um, congrats to both of those runners. Um, I want to thank everyone for touching base with me um, about the letter that I wrote uh, in the last episode, and uh, just for your encouragement. It was uh, really nice to hear from so many of you and uh, some ideas to to add to the letter um, and just encouragement to follow through. So I want to thank you all. That was uh, really touching. So I appreciate you. Um, You may have seen on social media recently, um, you know, Ben and Mike, uh, obviously two for two at Cocodona, but we had so many athletes um, or I had so many athletes that I coached that just doing so many amazing things um, it's just been incredible to watch um, I had three athletes running in cruel jewel and they all finished um, drew Anthony's won the cruel jewel 50 miler overall um, three athletes finishing um, at the uh, quest for the crest uh, two at Yamacraw 40 miler. So, uh, athletes are busy. Uh, every weekend I kind of do a, uh, um, uh, a Facebook post for our team in uh, our private group. And, uh, it's just really cool to, to follow along over the weekend and see what these people, you know, can do. Um, uh, it's just so cool. So congratulations to, uh, to all the athletes and especially those that, uh, that finished cruel jewel races. Uh, what a tough event. So very cool. I'm very happy for y'all. Um, otherwise, high school, uh, man, we, we had the state meet the other day. That doesn't wrap up our season. Um, we still have some athletes going to nationals, but uh, the boys' West Henderson High School team finished third overall in uh, the 3A state meet. So proud of those boys. Um, my son himself was on the 4x8. He raced the 800 and the 4x4, and our 4x8 uh, surprised a lot of people and took second place. So a lot of cool stuff, just so much things. I'm so proud of these boys. A lot of school records. The 4x8 had a new school record. 4x4 uh, had a school record. Um, our miler, Hudson Rice, had a school record in PR. So a lot of just so many cool performances. So inspiring to see. Um, probably made my run a little too hard yesterday because, <laughs> well, there was a few things going on. But uh, just really inspired by these kids. And it's so cool to, to see them doing so well. So um, just love uh, love my job love what i do and um, if i can talk to you about coaching uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, communicate with me any which way there's plenty of ways to look in the show notes uh, remind you to check out the show notes as well because there's a ton of resources in there from this episode and you know, a lot of books and things that we talked about in this episode i've posted in the show notes so please go there and check out those um, a lot of resources for you guys and if you have questions of course reach out let me know uh, love to hear from you i appreciate all the feedback appreciate hearing from you guys um uh, of obviously any topics that you want to hear about or people that you want to hear from. Uh, I know I communicate a lot of times and do interviews with my athletes because I think there's things that we can pull out and learn from and move forward. Maybe hear some things that uh, we can talk about with, uh, with training ideas, you know, things that went right, went wrong, but um, certainly happy to have those conversations. So please let me know your thoughts uh, and ideas. Um, I just got word uh, we're going to be volunteering at Hard Rock. We'll be at the finish line, so I'm um, pretty excited for that. Uh, we'll be there for uh, kind of the, the golden hour finish and all, so very excited to be part of that for Hard Rock. Um, training is back at it. Um, I'm wearing my watch again and posting to Strava so you can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, as I have time, I update Strava to kind of give you an idea of what I was doing during the day. Um, and of course, you know, if you're on Strava, it's a good way to ask me questions. Uh, what, you know, why'd you do this? What's going on? Um, you know, happy to answer those questions too. So, um, please, you know, like I said, feel free to reach out. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for being a part of the podcast. Uh, I want to thank my Patreon supporters, as always, for helping me c- continue to, to do this. Um, really, I've been enjoying it. I really enjoyed those conversations that I had with uh, with Ben and Mike. Uh, just so happy for the two of them. 250 miles, big step up in distance for each of them. Uh, so really cool episode. Really happy with that. So um, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I know a lot of goal races are coming up, so good luck to you and all of those. And And uh, keep moving forward, my friends.